Okay, cameras are restarted. Yes. I was on my ramble. But the point being is, I get asked about what should I do to be a gunsmith. If you want to be a modern gunsmith, which is what we would call an armor in the old world, mm -hmm. there are a number of classes for that. You guys know where to go. If you want to be an old world gunsmith, I'll be perfectly honest with you. You could do exactly what I was planning to do. Uh, and just haven't had the time to do it. Anybody could do it. There, If you go to books.google and Hathi Trust, those are two great websites, and look for blacksmithing books about flat springs. And there's so many. And you can put in the word gun or pistol or rifle or whatever else. I have found at least seven ways that are in my notes to do heat-treated and tempered springs. Uh, some of them require crazy stuff like heating up lead. Some mm -hmm. of them are just on charcoal. Some of them are just with a torch, whatever. There's so many ways that people say they did them. They don't give you the whole story every time because they assume you know other stuff. Right. But just going through and experimenting with those methods, you could probably come up with a very good process all your own and enjoy a lot of success. And I will give you my money for the things that I need repaired. And I will tell everybody that you exist if you can do it right. So, uh, that if you can do it right, I, there's so many springs I need. Let me I tell know. you, I have so many broken springs. I know. And, uh, if it's a coil spring, you can always find a modern equivalent, but when it's a flat spring, that's when you need an artisan. So my young blacksmiths out there, let me know. Okay. Um, next question. Then. Oh, yeah. Uh, will repercussion be expanded to include some of the U S military muskets, rifles, and maybe even cowboy guns? Do you want to feel that one? Um, not right now, no. Not right now. No, maybe one day, but I'm gonna do them all. Okay. If it's if they make a good reproduction of it and the original is expensive, I think we should do a repercussion of it. I can see us doing it. I just don't know when. Uh, there's no actual current plans set to do any. I've had um, maybe somebody can answer this for me. Mm -hmm. You know, some of you may be aware of this. There's a model 1842 pistol that was produced. In South Carolina, the Palmetto marking. Okay. It's probably just parts brought in and assembled sure. in South Carolina. But uh, I've heard there were reproductions of those, uh, other than the Indian ones. I know there were Indian ones that are garbage, but I heard there were other okay reproductions. Mm -hmm. It's hard to look up. If you own one, let me know. I'd be curious to see one. But uh, something like the 1842, where there's reproductions available. Okay. Yeah, not just the South Carolina version, but just that came to my mind while I was talking about it. It's late at night. Mm -hmm. Um I would, I would do, like, an 1842. That'd be fun to do without sure. having to ruin an original. Um, frankly, there's a lot of percussion era stuff that we could cover in terms of rifles and blah, 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 blah. It's just that percussion stuff in general tends to take more time. Um, yeah. So there's just more space in between those episodes. So you notice we may only have one a year, if two. Well, assuming no travel, no travel for special projects. Mm-hmm. Uh, or guests coming in and taking up time. Uh -huh. uh, not that we're complaining, but just no, assuming those things are happening. Yeah. It's where that just happens. Then we could probably get out one repercussion a quarter. We could probably get upwards of four a year. But that would assume that we're not doing a lot of other things. That would assume we're real boring. <laughs> because repercussions tend to add a couple days to the schedule compared to a normal episode. Oh, yeah. Just Which doesn't sound like a lot, but that is actually a lot in our world. Well, if you think about it, to go out and test fire the piece, what do you do? You go out and you shoot it, you come back, and you have to detail strip and clean it because it's black powder. Mm -hmm. And you can't just go out, go to the indoor ranges. You have to go to outdoor right. side. Can't test fire indoors. Can't can't just take it out, shoot it, put it back on the shelf, and then shoot it again a week later when you're on the schedule. Rarely have any of these repercussions come in that they have been working perfectly. Right. So the... Repairs. The, there's also, like, we got to find... To keep the story interesting, we're going to have to start making the skin cartridges. We have to get special bullets. We have to get whatever, you know, we have to make sure all this stuff's in place. Mm -hmm. um, and I get it. You're like, oh, yeah, you hand load a lot of cartridges for a lot of guns, too. And we do. But that's like its own process versus like uh, contacting the guys at Era's Gone and be like, do you have any stock? Can you loan me one that you don't have in stock? Because we don't have everything that they've made. Mm -hmm. Or Anyway, it gets weird. And so there's always something with the Black Powder series that just gets in the way. Mm -hmm. So we can only do them so fast, which means... We are already pre-scheduled all the way through, like, a year from now, just in what we know we're doing. Because mm -hmm. we got to hit the Colts. Yep. Or 1851. For those of you who are excited, yes, we found a reproduction of the 1855 route. 
-hmm. It's out of time because the people who reproduced this did a bad job. Is anyone actually excited about that one? 1855 Root? Yeah. I guarantee you a lot of people actually are. Okay. Because that's one of the least explored Colt pistols because it's just, it was never a military one. Okay. Um... And then we can get in the 1860, 61, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And then I would like to do uh, some work around uh, even, like, the Confederate revolvers and stuff because we have the Lamat repros and things already on hand. Yeah. It's all coming. It's just we got to get there. Time. Um, Which that actually answers the next question. What's the future of the Black Powder series? Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. I yeah. just answered there all There we go. That. <laughs> Two for one. <laughs> Any time and or desire for not 1911 series activities on the California trip? So the California trip is uh, actually planned at the moment. Mm-hmm. I am not telling any of you mothers when we're going. <laughs> uh, we've been running into some trouble. Oh, yeah. Which is that it's it, every time we try to do anything that involves other people, it gets really sticky. Mm-hmm. Uh, more so as we've grown, people's feelings are getting into it a good bit. People have expectations of what we're supposed to do when we're which, around them. Which is understandable, to a certain degree, but unfortunately, we, uh, they, most people tend to forget that that is us uh, working. Right. These aren't these aren't fun trips. Well, I mean, they are. They can be entertaining, and it's just like you find your own work entertaining or fun to a certain degree. But we are there for our business. Yeah, and also we're on the clock. You got to understand. Uh, we do the especially the guys that listen to the podcast behind the scenes understand a lot of what we're going through, and it feels like we're. Um, intimate, mm-hmm. uh, like friendly intimate. Well, they hear the, they hear the podcast and stuff too, so they they understand. Right, but but anytime I'm in public, uh, especially with an audience, audience, I'm gonna have a shield up. You know, what I mean, there's gonna be that sort of like professionalism mask. It's true. And the problem is, if I'm doing a gun show for two days or uh, an open event, and then driving for fourteen hours, and then an open event or whatever, it means that at some level. There is no downtime. There's Mm-mm. nothing. And we, and we to- have to have our A game on because we're not just meeting fans or meeting potential business contacts or or whoever else there. Yeah, to be fair, I wouldn't treat a fan any different from potential business contact. It's just the sense that, like, I am on I'm on guard. You yeah. know what I mean? And so on a trip like this, when I have to get out to California, I'm going to meet with some other personalities while I'm doing it. Those days are planned. I'm already on the road in between. It's already going to take a lot of time to make that trip, which mm-hmm. means a lot of production time lost, which means I can't spend any extra days out just for the sake of doing something that isn't directly cash up work related. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's It's got to be something that pays to, to the job or else I just, the problem is we're so overworked that everything we do has to pay a little bit. That might've been the question that they're asking. They're just asking if there's any non 1911 stuff planned for when we're doing. That's true. I guess it's not acting. So let's put it this way on terms of fan service directly, like hang out meetups. No, Mm -hmm. um, way too difficult. It's too far out. to do. And all that, but every time I announce one of those, there will be someone that frankly, I don't have the time for, but still love that's in the area. Cause Mm -hmm. we now have friends all across the United States, which is great, but it's really insulting to them to be like, yeah, we're, we're right outside your town, but we're not making time for you. You know what I mean? Like it's, so I gotta be careful. I gotta just kind of run, run dark on that and just get it done. Right. Um, because I just can't see everybody along the way. There's and no then, way. As far as, I guess I kind of let the bag out. Um, I'm hoping to meet with a number of other gun tuber people mm-hmm. on this trip. Everything is tentatively planned, but, right, but nothing the, is set hundred percent in stone. <laughs> well, so, well, the plan is go straight across, like do the mission first, which is Colt 1909. So we're just haul butt across the entire United States, and the only reason we're driving is so that we can take all of our equipment without problem, and then when we come back, we can hit these other guys. So it's like, haul butt across, cross your fingers, nothing goes wrong, mm-hmm. show up, and then work with the 1909. We have a buffer in there to get that done, and then, and we've told everybody else downstream of this, once that's done... Then maybe we can consider meeting other people. Tentatively, we're going to meet this guy on this day, this guy on this day, this guy on this day. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, it's all geography, it's not how important the guys are, but they cascade down from each other. So the further are they down that list, the further down that list they are, the more likely they are to get bumped by something that unfortunately goes wrong. Right. Because we still have to get back, and the minute we get back, we have to hustle back into working. There's no break. We haven't had a day off... Uh, period. So, so September. Yeah. I remember. So, <laughs> well, Christmas. No, I still work Christmas Day. Yeah, it's true. I'm sorry. <laughs> I still I'm work just, Christmas you're, afternoon. You're right. I like how you joke about that, but no, it yeah, was about yeah. 5 p.m. when I started working yeah, again. Yeah, right, right. 
So the short answer is there's stuff planned, but it's even the stuff that's highbrow that's meeting with obvious personalities that are on our route. It's planned tentatively because right. it's just Mur- it wasn't Mark says Murphy was an optimist. Mm-hmm. So yeah. All right. Next question, Athias and May. What would you say has been the um, Sisyphus is Boulder? Sisyphus is Boulder. I hate that name. <laughs> well, of I'm your work. Too many S's? Yes, Sisyphus. Is. Did you ever really read a lot of Greek? I read some. Not really. Ask mom. I was. You know what? It's weird. You know how kids have that dinosaur face? Mm-hmm. I had a Greek face. Yeah. Um. You know, I watched Wishbone. <laughs> my, that I, was enough for me. <laughs> my nephew, I swear, he had this thing. You know the theme song for Wishbone? Vaguely. What's the story? Wishbone. And uh-huh. I only remember this because I, my nephew and my, you know, because my best friend and I are autists when uh-huh. we're young. And I have this kid nephew hanging out. Mm-hmm. And he would always sing the Wishbone song. Mm-hmm. But he would say, what's the story of Wishbone? I would do that too. I do remember that actually. Do you add the word of? I added the word of. And we go... Bro, it doesn't say of. It just says, what's the story? Wishbone. Because it's asking Wishbone, what's the story? Right. And that's what we would explain to him over and over again. And you go, oh, okay. And then you just immediately start singing, it's what's the story, story of Wishbone? Wishbone? And we're like, <laughs> <laughs> You know he's probably doing it on purpose. I, who knows? Oh, oh. He, was, he was kind of dumb. <laughs> oh, why would you? This gets back to him, Dan. I love you, buddy. Uh, I will always love you. Anyway, um. <laughs> so I'm assuming this means what was what was our uh, essentially hard hard ass. No, no, they're asking here. what have we never gotten ahead of? Oh, okay. Ever, uh, lots. Believe it or not, um, because it's this idea that we keep pushing the boulder up and then it just rolls Keeps back, roll down back down. And we okay, push it back yeah, up. all right. Um, the number one thing has been funding growth. Um, we have had so many plans on how to do this series mm-hmm. and how to do it right. And we've grown the show for things we thought we were adding flavor to it. So 3D animations, things right. like that, uh, giving you more abilities to do extensive research. Well, we've, we have created an incredible powerhouse of a show. Um, I, I will not shy away of how proud I am to be... Uh, we are the kings of long format firearms content. I would like to say that as well. And I'm yeah. not even saying like just the historical stuff. I mean, I, I get it. There's modern stuff that we don't cover. But if we did, is there any doubt that we would be the kings of long format firearms? We we go through the entire lead up. We mm-hmm. go through the animations. We tell you every little bit and boodle we can about it to the point of like, what do I skip? I skip individual marking things for identifying whatever. When they become too numerous to be worth it, and it's also just go by the book, right? Right. But other than that, we're, we're in, okay? And uh, we've created a lot of short-form content, like the Minute of Maze, that are snappy and go off of advice from other people. hmm And it's interesting, but right when we got the Minute of Maze rolling and they were really picking up steam, what happens? YouTube's like, no, we want everything vertical now. And it's just such a pain in the butt to film firearms vertical because the only thing you can really film vertically for firearms that makes any sense is POVs. Pistols. Oh, POVs, yeah. Uh, like uh, Tenacious Trilobite's a friend of ours. He mm-hmm. actually, he started his channel after hanging out on our Discord and, and wanting to play with his old guns and film them and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and like he has a channel that's doing really well just on the shorts format because he does things vertically with POVs. Yep. And it's brilliant. And he's, well, and we've he's loved, done an awesome job for it. We've yeah. had the whole talks about trying it out. But the problem is we're an hour and a half from our range. So we have to do a lot of work to go out and film those things more so than you'd think mm-hmm. in addition to all the other work we're doing. So we've created this core, high torque, very valuable product. Yep. And we get a very good donation from our average viewer. For mm-hmm. those of you that show up, the number of you that donate is very good compared to other channels. Yes, absolutely. The trick is getting people to show up because every time we try to get around YouTube's BS, they just hammer it. Yep. And at first, we were conspiratorially paranoid about it. You know, we're going, it feels like we get a thing and it works and then it doesn't work again and we can't, we just can't catch the wave. We just can't. And it, I feel like kicking, kicking myself in the it crotch. It really wasn't until the Abity episode that I 100% knew that there was something flagged for our channel. Yes. We are individually marked by YouTube that we may not grow. And you cannot convince me otherwise. I will go to my grave believing it simply because of the Abity episode. Yep. 
which is that when we did the Abity Revolver episode, it exploded. And May had been playing with the um, hashtags or something. Yeah, I've been playing with the hashtags and stuff and, and something that I something, settled on did well. We somehow broke out of our bubble. And when we did, within 48 hours, we gained something like 10,000 subscribers, yeah. 12,000, something like that. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, we had this massive growth spike. A huge amount of comments saying, I've never heard of this channel. Right. What's and, going on? This is amazing. It'd be fine if we just had a growth spike and then nobody was saying anything or we're getting a bunch of sex spam or something like that. But no, it was people going, how have I never seen this show? This is the best show. Blah, 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 blah. What is going on? Blah, blah. And then we had people from Portugal going, this is amazing. I haven't seen my gun. Like, nobody talks people. about Portuguese. Yeah, that's great. Saw, and then we had splash over to other Portuguese episodes and we had splash over to other like antique stuff. And it like there's this big network effect where I went, oh my god, this is the first time in since before Project Lightning because mm-hmm. even Project Lightning didn't have that kind of splash. No, it's the first time we've had growth. Yep, significant growth. And then you, I don't know if we've said this publicly except for on the podcast, YouTube on the back end. All of a sudden, we have this red banner after 48 hours that says mm-hmm. we believe that there's suspicious activity on your account, bot, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And then we're like, what is that? Before we mean? know what's happened, they stripped 10,000 subscribers. No, it was 15. They went over the oh, number that's that we right. gained. They went over it, yeah. And then for the next, I mean, still, I still have people, but it's hard to tell how close it is to the thing. Mm-hmm. I still have people going, when was I unsubbed? But for. They have unsubbed me before. For Yeah, you got unsubbed in that. I have uh, access to the admin account and they unsubbed me. Yeah, and then like one of our admin accounts got unsubbed. And uh. for weeks after that, Tons of messages going, when was I unsubbed? When was I unsubbed? Because we saw 15,000 people stripped off of our channel at random, not the most recent 10 or 12,000 that came in, but just randomly pulled a number in excess of the number we gained. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, what other mechanism? So then we go go on six months later, nine months later, I can't remember how long. Something came up where we were working with Ian. Mm -hmm. Ian gave us a big shout out Mm -hmm. on a popular video. Mm -hmm. And we had a 2,000 user push in about 24 hours. Yep. Cue the red banner. I immediately If we get more than 100 people a day. Than that. The red banner shows up. Mm Mm-hmm. And this time, May's like, May went nuts trying to get a hold of somebody at YouTube. And And I was like, what is this? I weirdly managed to get somebody in their support and went... The hell is going on? And they're going. Right. And they're going. Well, it's well, suspicious activity. And I went. We got reference on this popular video here. Here's the timestamp. This is where the activity is coming from. And they went. Oh, we'll get back to you on that. Well, I never heard anything no, back. No, except. That. Well, we don't really have any control because it doesn't work that way. Like, didn't no, they kind of deny no, it? No, hold on. Uh, you're you're getting oh, okay, ahead I'm of sorry. me. Literally said that, and then within 24 hours, I didn't hear back from the chat, which was how I was supposed to hear back from them. The banner was gone it's and we had an email managed. that was saying just so you know like we always try to monitor spam blah 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 you never know when this is that or this is that they don't say that they haven't done anything to the account the red banner's gone and the number of subscribers hasn't changed luckily but that's it right okay meanwhile i'm turning around and i'm seeing channels that have three hundred thousand subscribers practically overnight mm-hmm. and they have thirty thousand views as their maximum number of views on a video so they're using bots of some sort but they're not getting caught in whatever this is. Yeah, no And the account's a year old. You know? Yep. That'll happen. But sorry, that was a long rant. But the point being is the number one problem we're having is that we are bottlenecked. Yep. And even if YouTube will share us, the only way to see us is through Forgotten Weapons, weirdly. Because we're in this corner where if you watch uh, Grand Thumb or Administrative Results or Donut or any of those other guys that are like gun tubers that everybody thinks of when they hear gun tuber... You're never going to get a CNR yeah. video. You might get a Forgotten Weapons one. It's and true. And if you happen to click that and watch enough of those, you might get a CNR video. And that's the only way you're going to get a recommendation. You won't get it from watching Drac. So, you won't get it from, now, so before I cut them off real quick, just be sure to like and share, subscribe, or at least comment No, I don't something? even care about any of that. No, no not on YouTube's platform. Well, we're elsewhere. about to lose the cameras. Link it elsewhere. Okay, the, the cameras. camera's going down. I mean, yeah. we'll be right back. We'll be right back. To push the button and came back and now I'm not yelling. Okay. Next question. <laughs> what is your five years for plan for CNR? CN Arsenal. Okay. Five year plan. Do you have a five year plan? This. Right here. Um, we're stuck. <laughs> it's it's desperately bad. I have some thoughts about what I can do, but I can't say any of them without ruining it. Um, but we're on like plan Foxtrot. Mm-hmm. We have tried so many things quietly behind the scenes and just pushing in one direction or the other. 
And the problem is every solution requires, just like the ramp uh, rant I just went on, mm-hmm. every solution requires going around YouTube right now. Mm-hmm. But YouTube is literally the only thing that brings views because nobody goes off-site anymore. Mm-mm. And it, there's something, that's, there's this weird effect where if you mention CN Arsenal anywhere on the internet other than YouTube, yep. which I guess you don't mention it on YouTube, mm-hmm. everything just kind of goes white and nobody responds to you and then they just keep moving on. I think it's because we're not controversial enough. Uh, we're not meany enough. I don't know what the case is. We don't have a viral element because we're presenting a solid product, so nobody can complain about it. That's true. And if you can't complain, if you can't whip up drama, then you can't get external attention. So, um... Yeah, I'm not really drama-focused, I have to say. No, I have some plans around if we could just sustain the funds, then we can maybe divert some over here, or I can make some side deals with some other guys to do X, Y, and Z. But the problem is by discussing that, I'm going to out other guys that are in the middle of planning things with me. Right. Um, but they're all essentially tangents. They're all attempts to go this way and tack up wind. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? I can't, the, 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 the wind is too strong. I can't go straight into it. I've got to like creep up on it and it's driving me insane because from my perspective, I just want to make the good show and put it on there and all the people that like it should be able to find it. Yeah. But I'm caught in a political bubble that I don't participate in. Mm-hmm. And it's actually it's kind of driving me crazy because it's like, if I'm going to be punished anyway, why am I not running my mouth? And the answer is because I don't want to ruin our credibility to you guys. And I don't want to... You guys are tired of hearing it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I will say, by the way, I just remembered something from an earlier question. Okay. About what I wish people would write more about. Sure. I don't know why it came to mind. Okay. But it's late at night. I'm going to say it again. In addition to biographies, nobody writes about law, uh, historically gun law. They they whine about it, they whinge about it, and they compare it to it. But actually putting together a strong uh, documentary effect on gun manufacture and law would be really fun. Because remember what we found that was kind of surprising? Smith & Wesson was seized by the government during World War One. How many people knew that? Right. Is there a book about that? No. There's a handful of like a handful of quick scribbles in like old law journals, and that's it. Yep. They they nationalized Smith and Wesson and put army officers on the board of directors. That's wild. But no book. No. Not, not even in the Smith and Wesson books, really. Mm-mm. Anyway. That would be pretty cool. Right? Yeah. All right, next question. What was the episode or firearm you dreaded covering the most? 1911. Really? Because everybody's going to complain. Everyone will complain. I dreaded doing the short magazine Lee Enfield because everybody complained about that yeah. too. Yeah. No, you're not wrong. Right. Anything that's hecka popular. Then I have to deal with bloke. It's going to be mad at you. Rim jam. <laughs> Rim jam. Uh, no, the magazine was fine. That's why they were on the Mark V magazine by the time they got to the smelly. You're not wrong, though. Anything that's majorly popular, even Springfield 1903, it's still one of those episodes that you kind of dread leading up to because just everyone's going to have. For yeah, fun lore. <laughs> just white knuckling at me and like, all right, here it comes. <laughs> Honestly, the dread is not really the word. There's actually stuff that you just get mired. Where you just you start doing it, and you're like, ha, 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 oh my god! So like the uh, occult pocket models, right? We were all hyped about that, being like, this will be an easy one. Why did I say that out loud? Yeah, you don't say those oh words my god. out just loud. The We've number learned. of refilms and things we forgot to do, and just like just utter chaos on mm-hmm. that revolver. Mm-hmm. But this every repercussion though, every repercussion turns into pure chaos oh god, in yes. ways you cannot expect. One of the walkers said, "Okay, that's true." The walker was like. Well, oh, no, I'm bad. sorry. One of the dragons did okay, and the walker did good. Yeah, but even the dragons, like, we went to go shoot them, and you're like, are you kidding me? This thing doesn't work. Like, right. Anyway. Yeah. Love it. All right. Uh, what were some of the most fun and memorable episodes for you guys to make? Go for it. Some of the most fun and memorable. Probably um, one of my most memorable. <laughs> what are you mad about? I'm just laughing at the cup. It's not a Carlisle 551210, just so you know. Did you guys see that? I have crappy coffee in a clear cup. Uh, do you want it's to, not crappy coffee. Do you want to tell them about this? You want to tell them why we right, have briefly, this cup? And then I, I promise I'm coming back to that. We only have that cup because I thought I found Carlisle 551210. For any of you that know, that actually know, that was the old Pizza Hut cup that used to exist in like the 90s. Essentially. May, May kind of, the, the whole Pizza Hut thing kicked off online and May's like, I do kind of miss Pizza Hut though. 
<laughs> like she, and I said, I just missed the red cups. They were cool. Yeah. And she's, she thought to herself, I'm going to be nice and get with eyes that red cup, which was the sweetest thing. I oh had. yeah. And no. And then I, I found out that stupid nightmare scenario. Yeah. Cup is just not anywhere online. I even actually called the Carlisle company and I got a hold of their customer service department and they said they actively stopped making them years ago. So then she asked about, because they start asking about other models and they're going through this whole thing because it's like industrial order, right? Uh-huh. And she goes, no, I just want the Carlisle whatever crap, right? Yeah. Somehow there's a miscommunication mm-hmm. because she has to leave contact information for them to contact her back and right. there's a whole form. So next thing you know, maybe, maybe it's a crate. Yeah. Like how many were in there? Like uh, 24. 24 of these yeah. show up at the but house. they're the 12 ounce. So they're they not even have, the right size. They need to be the 16. So they show up at the house. <laughs> like, I called them and I went, uh, I go, What's you guys need to send this to me because it just, it's here now. And they're like, oh yeah, we went to send you a sales sample or something. And she goes, no, but I wanted Carlisle whatever. And they go, oh, we don't have that anymore. And, and she I goes, like, yeah, we went through this. Okay. <laughs> and then, and then, Can I send these back to you? Oh, we'll get you a return label. Two days later. Hey, I never got the return label. Oh, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you end up with a case of these things. So okay. we ended up giving like all but three away to the boys. Like oh, four. I kept, I kept four. A set of four because yeah. we didn't need a case. And now the boys have a nice 20 set of them, actually. They're pretty resilient cups, actually. I, mean, I kind of like them. Just... They hold a surprise. They hold. Tw- it's a 12 ounce cup, so they hold a surprising amount of liquid. But anyway, yeah. So that's how May boosted cups that she didn't want. It's okay. They're, they're fine. They're not what I wanted, but they're fine. Anyway. Sorry, back to your question, bud. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are some of the most fun, memorable episodes for you guys to make? Honestly, I really enjoyed the first time uh, when we went out to Kentucky to visit our buddy Jeff. Oh, yeah, I love Jeff. And too. we got to experience the Lewis gun. We it's got not to just experience... the first time, though. I just like hanging out with Jeff. Oh, yeah. Well, thank Jeff, you. Jeff, I love He's you. He's a sweet boy. He always seems like nervous when we're hanging out. Oh, we went to see Jeff. Yes. And uh, dropped. Also, his mom's very sweet. We had, we had to uh, make sure that his Lewis gun got home and everything. Mm-hmm. And. Um, that's where I was going with this, actually. Mm-hmm. So this is last time I went to see Jeff. We've learned that there's, like, if here we have uh, Red Wing shoes that won't even order stuff for you. They're real jerks. And for some reason, in Kentucky, they, they have every boot available. You can tell it's late at night because yeah, he is Sally Segway this evening. So I just hang out and wander around with Jeff. We go to the boot store. We go to the gun store. We have mm-hmm. a good time. Mm-hmm. This time we go back to his place or whatever, and his mom's there. Mm-hmm. And she immediately is like, you must be outside. It's blah, blah, blah. He talks about, you know, I was just like never had anybody's mom recognize me. That's she even... invited us over to the pool. <laughs> that was, you come back and bring no, the dogs to the pool. She's like, you got to bring the dogs to the pool. And I was like, what? And she's like, we put the dogs in the pool. And I'm going, my, dogs my dog love would that. love that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, but then I'd have to drive my dog a really long distance. I don't think she'd like that part. Oh, she'd but, be so mad. Yeah. <laughs> she, I'm pretty sure, vacate several times in the car. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, visiting just fun. Uh, that was one of my most memorable fun about, trips. Say just Pleasant or memorable? Episodes. Memorable or most fun. And oh, most memorable fun. is Tiga Bear. Because I yeah, was Tiga Bear. delirious. You had a fever. It was, I had a fever. Before. I couldn't get the high speed recording of I you. Had a, I had like a 102 very fever. very upset. And I was laying in the back of a truck bed and it was like 97 degrees out with high humidity. Uh-huh. And I'm just going. It was the one day we had for the rain. And I'm just guiding everybody from the bit of the truck because even at that point may hadn't gotten hot on the cameras yet Mm-mm. and i'm just sitting there directing while just out of it like that episode 22 i cannot believe we got that footage i can't believe either and it turns out we couldn't have to be in a rush because jeff's really cool but we didn't know it at the time so right. i was just like trying to hustle you also had a fever and didn't think to ask or anything or... oh what a nightmare I and know. then other memorable ones um there's a ton there really is there's it's... a lot of things i remember but i'm just trying to like God, my brain. I think it's because late at night. I'm just kind of freezing up. Doggy um, and Project Lightning is very memorable for a lot of reasons, both oh, miserable yeah. and fun. Miserable and fun, yes, definitely. Project uh, Lightning, when we got, we had we had uh, software errors that were so bad mm-hmm. that we were chain reprocessing stuff with a failure rate of like seventy percent. So you just have to recompile it. Just yeah, recompile just it because we, we, just we just made the Valentine's Day promise and we wanted to meet it. So I stayed awake for sixty three, three, four, 63 hours, sixty three hours straight. And I just, I remember that part. You made me take a nap somewhere in between that 63 hours. Yeah, I made you sleep because Probably, you, you I did like a... I took about a five-hour nap, You yeah. did like a 48-hour run and then got a nap in and then came back at it for another like 20-something. Yeah. Um, that was bad. 
But I was really tired. That one was bad because towards like hour 50 something, I remember distinctly being like, those spiders aren't real. You're not fooling me. (laughs) And I was just concerned that I I was was telling me and Susan the rest. I was was going, I know that you're not trying to kill me, but I sincerely believe you're trying to kill me. Like the, the paranoia kicked in, but my logic was holding out. So I was just like, I have every emotional sense that you are trying to kill me. Mm -hmm. I logically know you're not trying to kill me. So that was a fun ride. I've never done that before. Never will again. That was not helping. No, no, that was not that took good. us months to recover. Um, <laughs> I went to go to sleep on hour sixty. We say sixty three because uh, I laid down. Yes, and it took me two hours to go to sleep because I forgot what sleeping was. Yeah, you like, couldn't do it. You were having a hard time. Nobody's ever told me that before. That you can be so tired that you don't know how to sleep. That's that was a weird feeling. That was interesting. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the, the, there's a lot of extra fun and memorable things <laughs> out there, but unfortunately. It's mixed in with our brand of memorable, which is miserable. <laughs> Everybody's thinking, like, we're going to be like, oh, when I pulled that trigger on the Villa Perosa, that was the coolest thing. And meanwhile, you're just thinking, don't go over the berm, you piece of crap. <laughs> I'm also thinking, don't bop yourself in the nose. And what did I do? I bopped bop myself in, in the, the nose. nose. Yeah, it's it's weird. But when the cameras are on, the pressure behind the guns is too high. You don't actually enjoy it as much as you'd think you would. I enjoy it after I see the footage and I go... Oh man, that was kind of nice. I get to actually <laughs> think of that's what I think about experience. it is when I go to edit the footage later. <sighs> <laughs> like that guy looks like he's having fun. I don't remember it that way. I'm smiling, <laughs> except for those first. What was it? Uh, there's like a six episode block um, in the very early stages where you told me, "Hey, we're getting a lot of weird comments about you smiling. Don't smile." And then you went, "Just don't smile for these next footage." Six episodes of me just. Looking pissed. Hey, can you go back to smiling? Because everybody's really mad the other way. Doesn't work. Yeah, we tried the viewer feedback and turned out you guys are liars. (laughs) All right, what else we got? Uh, Um, uh, Who makes the odd size ammo for the guns that you shoot? uh, Right now, Sue's. Currently, Sue's. Yeah, we've had a number of people help us in the past. There was a Jay started up. He got too busy. David gave us a hand for a bit. He's way too busy mm-hmm. and easily distracted. I love you, David, but God, man. He's oh, he's got the fish now. He's very distractible. <laughs> and then, um, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much been it. Yeah, Susie's really taking it over. I mean, mm-hmm. I try to fill in when I can, but... Uh, You're slowly picking it up, yeah. Well, the tr- we got to the point where we could at least structure things so that we can... Suze is working on stuff now that we won't be filming with until the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And that's making things awesome. a lot easier. Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, what else? What? Uh, yeah, good time. Uh, could you describe your photography setup? Uh, oh, we've actually shown that. That's in one of our old videos of mm-hmm. uh, how we make the show. That's true. There is an old how we do it. Yeah. It's just a 60 inch long by, I don't know, like 15 inch wide box. It's really not that big. No, it's not big at all. It's long. But it, 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 it stacks up so that it's got. Um, I have had people that ask me for plans for it, and uh, I would not give them out because you don't want to build mine because it turns out I overbuilt it. I had an underlight, never use it. I have a close in light, never use it. It we turns only out. use one light with a with a white sheet over it. Yeah, you, you could get it's away over-light. with. You could get away with not even having a base. Yeah. But. I would recommend the base because it helps you put all the stuff in it when you're carrying it around. Mm-hmm. Um, but the base can, our base can get in the way of the photo sometimes. You have to have it very specifically tucked in there. Otherwise. Yeah, we have those overhangs for the lights that are in the base that we never use. Right. I would, except for sometimes we turn them on for small parts. Very but, small but parts. But realistically, really by the rare. time I do that, I could just lift everything up if I needed to. Yeah. Anyway, I would redesign it a different way. But the short answer is it's like a, just a box that rifles will fit in. And a, just a pair of 48-inch fluorescent lights mm-hmm. that seems – like, other photographers look at me and they're like, how are you pulling these images out of this? And the answer is, I am a very good photo editor. We have become that. Like, I just and, – and your, your skills on color editing are far beyond mine, though. I will recommend, by the way, and I've tried this before, but I overbuilt the box. Mm-hmm. Instead of doing a 48, what I would do if I could do it again – I would do two twenty fours and space them a little bit more. Yeah. Because when I get out to the 50, 60 inch guns, they get dark on the ends. Yes, they do. And it's always brighter in the center because it's right in the center of the bulb. So mm-hmm. if I just had two bulbs and separated them a bit, I think it would even out better. Probably. And then yeah. we just have some cloth to diffuse and then a thing on top to whatever. And that we, we made can it, hang the camera from essentially. We made it pictures. with uh, angle steel with the holes pre drilled in it so that we could just uh, put screws in to hold everything. Aligned. Vertical, yeah. So we can raise and lower the lights by just unscrewing them and lowering it down and rescrewing them. Mm-hmm. Um, but really, it's just 
Dude, if you can get fluorescent bulbs laid over it and control the light in the environment. So if you have, if I go into an environment with really bright fluorescent lights, I'll have to kill the lights. Yeah. Because they'll overpower my light box. But once you dial the camera into the color of the lights and it's a static photo, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. I could, the, the, even though they're not very bright, I can just do long exposures if I need to. It doesn't matter. I can just, as long as the camera is still and mounted properly, you don't have to go crazy on fancy flash whatever that everybody else is doing. Like I, I talked to so many photographers getting started, and they they sold me on all this crap, and it turns out parafluorescent bulbs and some patience in Photoshop, and you're good to go. Yeah, it just takes time and and pressure, like making a diamond. Yeah. <laughs> all right, uh, let's take a pause for the cameras. Okay. You you start reading. Okay. Show okay. them that you're capable right. of reading. Uh, I'm illiterate. <laughs> What if any military arms have made you think that's it? You had all this at your disposal, and that's the best you can do. And that's all the reading he will do tonight. He's not capable of reading. <laughs> What's wrong with you? I read it great. That was read poorly. Well, what is it? What, uh, what do you think? That you had all of this at your disposal, and that's the best you can do. I have an answer that's going to make everybody mad. <sighs> well, um... I'm trying to think. There's a lot of pieces that are pieces that we've had that have had hand fittings to them, like old revolvers and stuff like that. But then I don't know if, if it's a matter of that they had actual they had a bunch of stuff at their disposal and that was the best that they were capable of. So I guess probably it's going to lead to more of. God, I don't know. Um, really? It's got to be some bolt action rifle of some sort. Mm -hmm. What have you got? OK, you ready? This is the end of the show. Okay. Everything British. To be fair, they do take a long time to change <laughs> things. They like, take a long oh time. Actually, God. I was thinking of the Trantor 1868. I was thinking of all the hand fitting and stuff that goes in right, that kind of stuff. Right, You're going, seriously, this is the best you could do in 1868? And then what do you do? You go down to the 1878s, and you're like, this is the best you guys could do in 1878? You're Britain. Because you, the problem is, Britain is always just like, mm -hmm, especially like Victorian and like after, like well, right after Victorian. Basically, Britain up to World War II is all like, I'm Britain. And then their guns are just like, and also everyone loves them. The oh. Lee Enfield's the best. The Martini is the best. The whatever's the best. And then you just put them against other stuff in the era, and you're going, it's debatable if this is even acceptable. <laughs> I'm sorry. Everybody's going to yell. I get it. It takes 10 rounds. Okay, that's more than five. Fine. If I put a five-round magazine in it, tell me it's slicker than the Krag. Tell me it's slicker than the Monlicker Schonauer, which at least has front-locking lugs. You animals. Like... Yeah, how do you really feel about it? Well, let's just stick with the rimmed cartridge forever, because why not? We'll just design all of our machine guns around it instead of just fixing the problem. Even the U.S. got that right. No. Oh, damn. I'm sorry, we're doing the martinis, and guess what? They were, everybody, oh, the martinis are the greatest, blue blah, 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 single shot, whatever. Is it? Is it the greatest? It's fun. I'm hearing a lot of jamming in battle. Like, I'm hearing a lot of problems that I didn't hear from the rolling block, which was cheaper and already available. Rolling and then, was pretty good. Oh, wow, what are we going to do? We haven't even done this episode yet, mm -hmm. but it's just like, man, magazine rifles are really catching on. Let's make another martini with a slightly different bullet. And we're going to spend all of our time on that. We're going to make the perfect, slightly different bullet martini. Well, oh, wow. Everybody got mad at us because this was really stupid. Well, it's what they made, so it can't be wrong. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, British people. But for everything we've covered, your firearms are not innovative. They are always playing catch up. Except for briefly when you were doing revolver stuff against the Belgium Belgians. And then that was done by like 1856. I don't know. You didn't make it to 1860. By 1860, the Belgians were kicking your ass at handguns. <laughs> and the U.S. was kicking your ass at rifles. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. And everybody's going to get mad. And they're going to point out all these little examples. And you know what I'm going to say? A million other examples of just better shit at the same time. That didn't require constant go, iterative somebody, process. Somebody just go start commenting. All oh, yeah. What America did with the Craig is the Craig rifle is what Britain did with all of their guns. All right. Next question. <laughs> uh, what's the status on the World War One Galilean scope re replication? Um, I believe they're talking about the fact that we're trying to measure it. 
Oh, okay. Because we were trying to get a set of lenses. So, we, we first of all, somebody gaslit poor Jonathan Ferguson Ooh, of the Royal Army. Yeah. Who lied? Don't to know him? which one of you did it, but if I find out, like, somebody <laughs> lied to poor Jonathan and said that we hadn't received the Galilean sites, even though we told Jonathan we had. We, we made a pictures. video and sent him pictures. I have pictures of Rob and I playing with it. Yeah. I don't, didn't we put those on social media? Uh, I, don't, I don't remember. Anyway, um, the gun, the, the Galleon sights are here. Um, I've made a handguard that works with them. I have a rifle that works with them. Yep. Although it doesn't have the best bore in the world, but I think it'll shoot out to 700. I'm not really sure, actually. We'll find out. Um, everything's good, except... The sights are made out of, it's honestly the second lens, the further bigger lens, mm -hmm. is so incredibly thin. And yes. it already has three scallops on the edges. Yep. And it's very clear that it's loose in its frame in a way that there must have been some sort of gasket that's gone or maybe rust has eaten it away. I don't know what's going on. Right. Um, but the short answer is I refuse to shoot the Galileans, which cost many thousands of dollars uh, because I desperately need to resell them when we're done <laughs> right and uh if they're broken i can't do that so we're gonna get them measured uh i have the hookup on someone that does lens measurements but i they are far away from me and i would like to keep them out of the mail as much as possible so hand we're, delivery we're waiting for a hand delivery intersection between the two of us and then those things are going to get specked out uh in a very professional way mm-hmm and that way we can figure out, and this is not just like an optician, this is someone who does lenses. Right. Uh, scientific lenses. Mm -hmm. um, because they're going to be able to figure out the the, tu the tubeless tube that is the system. Yep. We'll be able to get an actual mathematical formulation on what the magnification is supposed to be. Nobody knows what that is. Mm -hmm. And then we're hoping that we can have a polycarbonate lens made or at least another glass lens made so that we don't risk the original when we test fire. Yep. So it's basically just down to linking up with someone, getting something kind of also expensive done, and then reproducing the lenses so that we don't have to ruin the original lenses. Yep. That's the plan. Yeah. Cool. Um, have you guys considered doing episodes on early 20th century silencers? No. What? I have. I mean, we haven't actually talked about it, so that means in my mind we haven't considered I it. I talked about it a lot, but you weren't there. Okay. I, have, I have guys that are manufacturers that are friends of mine, mm -hmm. and I'm always going, can we make, like, a maximum silencer? <laughs> I think there's a market. And the problem is they always say the same thing to me, like, you can't even unscrew them. They're all press fit together, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm going, I think there's a market. Like, the number of guys that would love to have a modern reproduction of a maximum silencer, mm -hmm. all brass, Yes, it's not as efficient. Yes, it's not as boo 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 cry cry cry, right? Mm -hmm. But there's a number of guys I think that if you made an accurate maximum silencer that they could put onto modern lever guns and stuff that they get a hold of and thread, I think they'd be ecstatic. Probably, yes. I would do it. I would buy, you know, some 357 whatever lever action, mm -hmm. have it threaded and fit a maximum silencer on there in a heartbeat faster than I'd pay for a lot of the other high tech whatever that's out there. And it would look awesome. Mm hmm. Uh, the problem with that is you have to have the technology to like the way they're made. You have to look at them, but they're sort of like press formed into shape into layers. It's kind of weird actually because I think you could just keep stacking them. They're oh, kind of yeah. designed like stacking cups. And uh, if anybody out there wants to make them, by all means, if you have the the ATF credentials and want me to help market that somehow, carefully, wink, wink. Um, don't email me because that's not allowed. No. Um, uh, anyway. Next question. I would love to work with those, but I don't know of any originals that I can borrow. Will the series go wherever and you cover weapons of less powers, e.g. Mm. the Owen gun from Australia? Will the series go wherever and will you cover weapons of, I guess, lesser yeah. powers? Yeah, that's what they mean. Yeah, I'd love to do an Owen gun. Sure. Um, we're basically covering whatever we want right now. Yeah, we're free now. Uh, people haven't really noticed it because they don't count everything. It's, it's such a weird scenario. They don't count the stuff before World War One <clears throat> as not World War One. Right, even though we're clearly not talking about World War One when yeah. we do the martinis and everything. And then <clears throat> they count inner war as just me going to World War Two. Uh, if I do inner war, that's World War Two. Mm -hmm. If I do anything before World War One, that's World War One. Mm -hmm. And so. I think one day I'm just going to do an SKS or something, and then everybody will realize I'm doing whatever I want. Like, oh. Because that's at least a, a measure that they can figure right, out. Right, right, right. 
That's so, a well-known one outside of that era. Of course, like, we'll do lesser stuff because we always have. We've done. Yeah. I mean, look what we did for World War One. We did all sorts of stuff. I, I prefer doing non-mainline stuff mm -hmm. because that's the stuff I'm curious about. Right. I already know the mainline stuff. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows it. it's in every Call of Duty game. There is that. Call of Duty. <laughs> um, will you ever be covering some of the very inexpensive 32 rimfire revolvers of the 1800s? No. No. Mm -mm. No. No design. It's too niche. Um, there's no innovation there. Uh, not no, but not really anything that translates. Um, if you think like 1893, the there was a 32 center fire gun that was really what became the first of the Colt new service line, but that's kind of really niche. Um, this is like the when we talk about the shotgun, the, we were going to do the repeating shotgun series, and that's mm -hmm. become a big debacle. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the uh, everybody wanted to loan us single shot shotguns, mm -hmm. but there are literally ten thousand makes of single shot shotgun. Yeah. It, that would be uh, that would be an impossible task. And also, I would go, okay, this one is a bit different than the other one, and it was made by this guy. We don't know who he was. He put his name on it, but it was probably made at this other place. Okay, be, we'll go shoot it. Like, I don't... Yeah, like, it'd be a two-minute episode of him talking. It's the same problem. It's just going to be like, this guy's name's on it. It's who just the a hell lot of... It? I don't know. There's a lot of lost data in the grunt world. It's oh, just yeah. gone. The, I, you can't bring it back. So, no. Also, I don't... Why would I... They're inexpensive 32 rimfire revolvers, but... How the hell am I gonna get a bunch of thirty-two rimfire ammo? Like you're asking for a very like I get it. You can do the twenty-two primer or whatever, but mm. great. Now I'm doing custom ammo for every single episode on guns that nobody's gonna watch because nobody cares because they can't get ammo. Right. So I just don't think that's financially viable. Nope, probably not. Um, have you ever considered doing some kind of long gun repercussion episode? And if so, which one? Oh, we oh, should we, put that with the other yeah, one. Yeah, I guess so. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm willing to do anything in repercussion. Mm -hmm. You know what I wish they would? You know what I wish they'd make a reproduction of? Hmm. The Hall Rifles. Oh, well, that'd be cool. I would yeah. love doing, like, Hall Rifles with a reproduction. Because mm -hmm. I feel a lot safer with it. But it also just be neat. I would buy a reproduction of Hall Rifle like that. That'd, that'd be, be neat. awesome. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Um, since you have moved into the interwar period of firearms, is there any chance of a couple of episodes dealing with the development of the double action compact pocket automatic pistols like the Walther PP and PPK, Mauser HSC, and or Sauer 38H? Yeah, they're all on the list for eventual doings. Yeah, eventual doings. Just as we get to them. Like, it's, it's all open now. Yeah. We're just, like we said, not going to just cover a piece. We cover prior to peace. Yeah, and we also, like, we're, we're deep into this travel log for the uh, backlog for the between Rob and then the, trying to get the 1911 wrapped because we really we thought we were going to not travel after Rob mm -hmm. and then boom that's when we finally get the, the 1909 shows up on a radar and we go oh we better get that knocked out while we can right so we're actually we've double compressed our schedule in a way we didn't mean to uh, once that's done I'm not going anywhere for the next year mm -hmm. like I just no F you um, and I'm going to use that time to start reading ahead on some of the World War II stuff that I'm terribly out of date on like i can tell you a lot of stuff about it but it's all 10 year old data because right. i haven't read about it in the entire time we've been producing the video series yep something to do um what's the plan mid-war years then onward to the second no we're doing anything we yeah. want yeah anything we want <laughs> same deal i don't know I, I guess we i've tried saying it here and there but the problem is i'm in short of making a well if I made a video that said, guys, seriously, we left World War One almost a year ago. I guess you could do once a year release a video that's, hey, this is the plan for next year. No, nobody would watch. That's the thing is nobody watches them. Yeah, if true. I do a video, you know, we have 100,000 views on American whatever. If I do a video that just says, we've already left World War One a year ago, <laughs> you didn't notice. <laughs> and I just release that video once a week for the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. One tenth of our audience would know that we have left World War One over a year. You know what I mean? Like they're just they're just gonna go, oh wait, really? Yeah. And then we're still nine out of ten are still gonna be like, what are you doing? And mm. I know you guys want World War II, and you're willing to interpret everything as World War II. Right. But we are now free. We will not we do uh, an elimination list. The problem is we're gonna do two episodes in a row on a World War II firearm, uh -huh. and then we're gonna go do something that's antique again, and they're gonna mm. be like, I thought you were doing World War II. That's what they're going to say. Oh, yeah. I can guarantee 100%. it. All right. Have you ever considered going into the history of how these older farms were repaired at the time? He knows gunsmiths 
aren't the best at keeping records, though. Uh, no, I'm not doing that. Unfortunately, no. That would, that would be... That, I mean, to do... Just like you said, the record keeping on it is just not great anyway. Doing that for, like, one country in one era would be, like, a PH, PhD-level effort. Oh, yeah. You'd have to go to that country, probably, to acquire records. And the original documentation. I mean, just... Of what was even there. Right. So, no, that would be way too hard. That's insane. Um, are you planning on covering any older European revolvers as well, such as the Adams or Lamette? Well, Actually, we, have, yeah. we have the reproduction Lamettes right here with mm-hmm. me. Um, to be p- transparent on that, I managed to... The way the Lamettes are stacked, the big the big Lamettes, the percussion Lamettes that everybody thinks about, there's essentially three of those. There's the, the first model... And then there's something they call the transitional model, which I don't know why you call that. Why don't you call it the, the second model? Right. And then they this always bothers me. They always establish like a first and a second, and mm-hmm. then they call something in the middle transitional. But it depends. It depends. Do you have is a trans a transitional to me means that it could have any one of a mix of features. Mm-hmm. But if you tell me these two things changed for all of them, then these three more things changed. That's not transitional. That's model one, two, three. If you tell me. A, D, and F change, but not all the time. Sometimes it's B and D that are changed up. Then that's transitional, random features. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, anyway, you get the idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm on a separate grape. I've lost the track. Uh, but yes, I would like to cover this. Nobody makes a reproduction of the atoms. No. Uh, so finding an atoms that's in shootable condition is a very expensive proposition. Yeah, kind of is. Uh, but I would like to cover it. One day, yeah, that'd be great. All right, let's take a uh, pause for the cameras. Sure. There's a brief break to let the dogs out. It is now 2.30 in the morning. It is, and they (laughs) desperately wanted to go. Yeah, they were all like... (sighs) (laughs) All right, let's keep going. Um, Next question. Looking forward to the shotgun series for some time, but to make that rabbit hole deeper, would you consider a series on British, European, and American doubles? (laughs) We cover this. No. Nope, no time. That's going to be left to somebody else, unfortunately. Yeah, um, unfortunately. Just doing repeating shotguns was already apparently too much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll get there eventually, but one day. Oh my god, we had such ambition, and then best nope. slayed plans. Yep. Um, I still have a bunch of shotguns. Though. Yeah, we do. They do fill up the racks. Uh, we Would will, you? We huh? will get to them one day. Yes. Actually, there's a sporting clay place near me. And if I could, I, I need to talk to them. I haven't gotten to talk to the owner. Mm-hmm. But it, that place is close enough that if we can make an arrangement with them and we can figure out how to film it, some sort of like camera, mm-hmm. just do like weird old shotgun sporting clay runs. That'd be fun. Yeah. Um, would you ever consider adding filler content in the form of occasional top 10 style opinion videos? Mm. Well, we've done a top 10 before. We've done it before, but I don't feel great about them. No, they're just... They are a filler. That's what they are. But, you know, to be honest, um, we we are going to do them, but they will be rare, which is what they are now. Yeah, that was part of the... Remember we were talking about the Sisyphus thing with trying stuff? Mm-hmm. That was one of those things we tried. And also would be a schedule break. I mean, it did break fine in terms of views, but it's it's kind of a, a rare occasion. It just doesn't seem to have the splash effect that you would hope. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think we will occasionally, you know... Once we clear the 1911, I think that gives us room to do top 10 uh, handguns of World War One because we already did top 10 rifles. Mm-hmm. And then the problem is that's really where we get limited because we haven't been able to get our hands on all the heavy machine guns. Right. Quote, unquote. So we we would need to get a hold of a Santity in 1907 and a... Um, potato <clears throat> digger. Potato digger and a... My brain is locking up. Uh, Fiat Rebelli. Okay. At a minimum, mm-hmm. in order to talk about doing a top 10 mach- you know, machine gun, machine gun. Mm-hmm. And then for light machine guns, we could actually do a top 10 on that almost, except for we've never been able to get a hold of a Bergman MG13. Right. Um, which is not the other MG13, which is very confusing for people. But <clears throat> if I could get a hold of a Bergman MG13 to film with, then that's really it for World War One light machine guns. The and we would have footage of all of them and experience on all of them. Mm-hmm. So we could do a light machine gun top ten. But we kind of did that with Project Lightning. It was just a really drawn out top whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> um, I understand this normally takes months, but I would like to see you go through the process of restoring, rehabilitating a non-functional piece for the show, kind of a time lapse episode. Well, uh, you sort of did that, but not on 
on CN Arsenal. You did that with that Savage pistol you were working on recently. Yeah, but I didn't, I didn't cover it. I think they're asking for more of like a anvil style of really getting into uh, it. <clears throat> okay. The problem is if I actually tell you what I'm doing, they just wipe it out. As a matter of fact, the Savage Revolver episode, we linked it on Facebook mm -hmm. where I repaired that Savage Revolver and it was cursory. And oh, yeah. Facebook ripped that down for being a hate crime. <laughs> like, not even, like, they ripped it down because I was threatening minorities. And I'm not even kidding. That's that's what they tagged it as. I do not know what the heck they were talking about. No clue. I cannot figure it out. The video and then talks I, I about up, you were, there was a little up, bit of repairs you Yeah, did. I put up a screenshot of it and went, Facebook ripped this down because I'm threatening minorities. And they ripped that down and yelled at me for doubling down on threatening minorities. And I went, repairing an 1860 Savage revolver mm -hmm. and putting, and you can see it on the uh, Determined Idiots side channel, which I had, unfortunately, because we've been working on just boring direct stuff, I haven't been able to add anything to that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, that, I don't... No clue. Uh, geez, but you can't you can't do gunsmithing realistically. Um, Mark manages to pull it off still, which is great, because when it was on our channel, we were starting to have real big problems. Mm-hmm. And then now that it's on some other channel, for some reason, he's okay. Uh, I, I don't understand. No clue. Again, it might be that thing we're talking about. We had that tag on our account somewhere. Yeah. But um, it's difficult to even have gunsmithing content. And then on top of that, unfortunately, we are not set up to film in our dingy little garage that I barely get stuff done in. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, I'm making it up as I go, and it would horrify people to see how the sausage is made. So I don't show them. <laughs> That's fair. Um, I understand this takes months, but I would love to see you go through. Oh, you said I that. said that. Yeah, sorry. With Rob Bloke and the chap submitting entries for a Cabin Fever Challenge this year, do you think you guys will try to shoot the event and submit an entry for next year? I, I have not been paying attention. I don't know what that what is that? I don't know. Some sort of challenge. Fever. Sorry, I should know, I'm, but to be honest with you, I don't really watch competition shooting or event shooting like that or we, challenge shooting. We've also been so focused on getting stuff done for the show these past few months that I honestly haven't been able to watch that much uh, extra content. Uh, yeah, I only do two kinds of shooting realistically. There's the kind that is necessary for the show and then the little tiny smidge that I do to relax. Kind of like baking at home. I just don't want to do any more not relaxing shooting and i'm just not a challenge match guy i've never been i'm a fat idiot that that reads books and then transcribes that information i don't think into you're more. an idiot but but yeah you, you'd probably enjoy it more than i would because I would. you were sporty when you were younger oh uh, yeah it's true i mean or i guess I'm i mean you're still pretty sporty still porty, sporty now somewhat no I'm, always, I'm still porty <laughs> i've always been a husky nerd that reads stuff so um my performance on those competitions is always just squat bottom. Well, frankly, I don't do a lot of my 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 experience with uh, with shooting firearms now has become so practiced at slow trigger pulls <laughs> that I think I would suck at competitions. <laughs> Shoot, right trying now. to shoot fast is not your thing, is no, it? No, it's it's not um, something I've got practice at. No, I'd like to. I mean, I'd love to have the time to practice, and I'd, everybody wants to get better at stuff. But the thing is, oh, I've, I would love to. Yeah, I've had to pick what I can do. And at, uh, uh, my average work weeks, when we're not pressed for time, are 70 hours plus. So there's just no room. Like, mm -hmm. I, I have no room for training other than very basic exercise, which is not even keeping up, apparently. No. So if I would, if I had the time, I'd spend more of it just doing basic exercise, let alone competition stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I hate it. I hate, you know, it feels... I remember someone was talking about having like a chronic illness mm -hmm. and how it's hard to kind of re-explain over and over again your limitations. And the more you re-explain, the more people are just like, oh, whatever, you're not blah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't have a chronic illness in this sense, um, but I do have this sort of chronic schedule limitation and priority limitation. Which is very hard for people to understand when your schedule is also something that you set. Right. Well, even if you don't set it, it's hard for people to understand. When you say 70 hours plus minimum, minimum a week, and then I must maintain relationships on top of that with various clients, let us say, or collectors or researchers because I have to do the favors back for the favors I got. Mm -hmm. Then I have to also make sure that I have a family of any sort that will still love me. Mm-hmm. And then on the very edge of the margins, I get to have a little me time. Mm -hmm. And they go, yeah, but come on, just shoot this one competition. And you're just going, 
I'm so tired. <laughs> like, and the problem is by saying that, it's no fun. No. Nobody wants to, like, even the people who's at home, half of them are just going, yeah, okay, fine, who cares, you know? Right. And I get it. Like, it's not fun to hear somebody else suffering through something. No. But it's where we're at. We don't We don't have the capacity to, to, to take give me more time something yet. extra right now. We really hope we would, but this goes back to trying to find ways to reach more people. Mm-hmm. Um, what was your most fun part of Rob's visit? The humor. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. I liked when uh, some little videos that have come out of I'm it. I'm kind of mad at him. With what? He did this thing where, like, we had the whole thing. We had a point of friction. We got over it, got back to work. Yeah. Um, and then he's being overly courteous. He's covering some of the funding gaps. Yeah, he's doing a good job. He sent me a present. So what are you mad at him for? I don't want it. I don't like the presents. Why? I don't know. I don't want to. You're being, I like the, the, you're being the, weird about I'm, this, I'm by in the two way. Minds. This is coming off poorly. Just I know. So you I know. understand. I'm in two minds because it is very sweet and I love it, but I don't, I'm not used to that, right? That's not an experience I've had a lot in my life where people are sweet to me. Oh, so you're just having a hard time accepting the kindness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like it. <laughs> well, just over kind it then return the favor that's what i have to do so that's the problem i'm gonna go bankrupt trying to keep up with like matching the gifts for gifts and he's saying no this is to make up for whatever and i'm like i don't care i'm southern so now i have to go do all this stuff back i just have to figure out when and how to do it and i'm gonna get you but i'm gonna go bankrupt trying to get you so stop doing nice things because it's gonna destroy me we're in a cultural (laughs) whirlpool i hate you also you're very sweet and i love you (laughs) <sighs> I'm complaining about how nice he is. I know. Can we just get to that part? But no, uh, the humor. Yeah. Um, David is a friend of mine that's on the range that doesn't really appear on the show. It, and, yeah, he owns um, the range with his wife. Yeah, especially his wife, Kristen. Though. Kristen was the one that was on the range the most with us. Oh, that's my God. Not a yeah, person, she, she was there a, every day. This is a person who is not a scene or character, but just a person that, you know. She gave it. us a hand every single day with that. That was great. And um, Rob blends in very well with our sense of humor. And it was just all every moment we weren't filming we were laughing mm-hmm. um what i ended up like laying in freezing cold water so he does this thing where he'll lay on the ground without paying attention to just where he's doing laying what i gotta down. do so rob's doing something i was like i get a it camera down rained. here and so like you don't think about it because it was cold it's cold but it's not that cold and so you don't think too much about it until you've completely soaked your crotch all the way through and all of a sudden you're going, oh, oh, the temperature's not coming back. My body temperature's not keeping up. Uh-huh. And my my bits are going literally numb. Yeah. So then Sue's had to drive an hour and a half out to bring me under pants and pants because I had frozen my crotch off <laughs> laying in a puddle to take this one shot of Rob. And they're going, we could have just put down a tarp or something first. And, I was like, and I'm trying to explain how the ground where my feet were was dry. So I just sort of like drop. Uh-huh. Not realizing that there is this hidden puddle in the grass <laughs> two feet down where the bar- parts go. Right. Like, I didn't realize there was wet. Mm-hmm. I just pfft, pfft, right into it. But, you know, no end of jokes there. And just, you know, like, I'm just mm-hmm. walking around like I peed myself. Yeah. But, you know, it's Rob, hardworking, willing to laugh. Everything, you know, is moving along. Mm-hmm. Um, really, the only friction was that we had two totally different filming styles. And it was just dragging everything down in terms of time. Mm-hmm. And that's going to happen. So yeah. minor complaint. Um, I think that's really it, though. Like, yeah, no, the the most fun part, though, I would honestly say for me personally, was just seeing little bits of video that come back out from that. Because, again, I see every I'm enjoying the moment, but I enjoy it doubly over when I get to see the post process. Yeah. And I liked watching the video of, of uh, you riding the bike, trying to catch oh, up the yeah, robbers yeah. of the yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. I don't know. It's kind of bittersweet because I wish you lived closer by. It's, oh, I it's know. hard having, along with every, He get along with everyone just fine with that. It's very hard having friends you really care about, but they're so far away. Mm-hmm. And I have a lot of those. Yeah. And it kind of drives me crazy because I can't live everywhere at once and I don't have the time to just travel around. You know? Oh, yeah. So. Um, have you ever considered making a book or several with the information you've eked out for so many guns using a lot of time uh do you say using a lot of time yeah oh yes um i have i have two books that are distinctly in mind Mm -hmm. and unfortunately again just no time to come and it's sad because they're real money makers to be honest with you i i could the problem is i would have to stop producing episodes of this show for months to get a book out as fast as possible or I'd have to sort of figure out a very smart way of ditching 
uh, two episodes a year or something to get that extra time. Or mm-hmm. There has to be some weird balance. And I just, I've never been able to figure it out. There's just so little time, like I said before. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> uh, the research project we're doing on revolvers is massive. And frankly, I'm probably the, in, in toot, toot, toot my own horn, mm-hmm. I'm probably the only person in a position to actually write the definitive book on the Marshall Revolver. Currently, Because yes. there is none. Uh, the closest book to that is a two-set volume by Rolf Mueller, who became the backbone of my research, and then now I've been scrambling to either prove or disprove his stuff. Mm-hmm. And I've had mixed results. He's not right about everything, but boy, for when he was writing it, he did a great job. And it's, that's a man I'd love to meet, and I never got the chance. He already passed away. Um, but The two you would have gotten along. I don't know. Personality, I have no clue. Mm-hmm. But in terms of Just actually caring about how... Yeah, I, in terms of being the only person I literally know of in all of the history books that care about how... And I know Taylorson's a popular book, mm-hmm. but Taylorson is sort of like, you know, just all over the place. Mm-hmm. I'm actually doing this, and this is too linear. It's like, you know, wherever. It's just a hodgepodge. And then it's so Anglo and American-centric that it doesn't stop to consider that almost everything's Belgian-made. Mm-hmm. Whereas Mueller was very aware of how much Belgium influenced revolver design. Um, he just didn't always know who did what. Right. Uh, the point being is I, I could write even right now, th- right now I can confidently from the top of my head, write the best military revolver book that covers all the military revolvers. Mm-hmm. However, off the top of my head, there's going to be big gaps working from my notes. There will be small gaps, but there's still gaps. So I've got to fill those with research. And unfortunately it's elimination research. So I'm spending a ton of money and time just just churning patents and getting yep. people to churn foreign patents for me. And luckily, I'm very, very thankful to have the help I do. On our Discord, we have Alpha Golf who's helping me basically oh, yeah. organize the whole thing. Alpha's a huge supporter on that front. So any, everybody should thank him if you're enjoying it at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have my buddy uh, Ludovic in France. Yep. Who's just going through the... He's dealing with the French patent archive because it's easier when Frenchmen talk to each other. Yep, Lars. And Lars is uh, doing the Belgians manually. He's been in that for long, even longer. Yeah, and the problem is there's still gaps. There's patents we know should exist in there that people referenced 50 years ago in writings that just can't seem to be found now. Like right. the, the, and, and not even like this post-war, you know? Mm-hmm. And so you're going, oh, crap, where did it get misfiled in this place, yep. you know? And then Jonathan had Lars come meet out with him over at Rural Armories to surf, sift through some notes, too. Yeah. Um, so we he went through Mueller's notes for me as best as possible, but unfortunately they're scattered and, and weird. Um, Mueller. Well, to be fair, we don't know where his core, like where it looks like what's there is actually, anyway, I don't want to get too far into it. Sure. Um, but the point is a few more years at this and I could probably write that book, assuming I can get the photography under control. Uh, and I'm working at it a little bit at a time yeah. as, as we do see in Arsenal episodes, it kind of helps because I can at least, and people are kind of going, there's a lot of revolvers, but it's kind of the way I've been able to start setting attack in that direction is by going ahead and doing these episodes while I'm doing these revolvers. Um, on the other side of it, I'd like to do an art book. Uh, we have a beautiful anatomy series. I have some ideas about how I could do that in an organized way. And to be honest with you, I started down that path and I have a lot of what I need either identified or on hand or with collectors that I know. Mm-hmm. Um, time. Yep. It, it just, That's going to be a process one. Uh, if um, I put out a call through our Patreon, Utreon on image editors uh, for a process that we use, I'm still looking for someone reliable. We lost our most reliable guy who is still sort of seasonal. I have a backlog of images that I need help editing. The process is fairly straightforward if you have Photoshop. Don't email me straight on that one, though. Either come to the Discord or... Uh, sign up as Patreon Utreon in order to do those. I, I'm i going to be awash with you. If I just say everybody can email me about it. Mm-hmm. Um, I've already had two email, email requests that came through Patreon Utreon. Neither one of them have responded to me in over a week or about a week, I guess. So it's sort of like I'm handing out this data and I'm setting up these little wells to let people try it out, which mm-hmm. takes time and freezes assets while I'm waiting on them to get back to me. Mm-hmm. So if I get 30 of those, it's going to be a nightmare. Um, I want you to be already an engaged person before you approach me about this. But if you want to go on the Discord, um, bottom of the scene Arsenal website, there's a little Discord icon. Click that. You should be able to join, no problem. Right. Um, it's a paying gig if you can help me with it. But the problem is, even with trying to pay people, no one has followed through consistently mm-hmm. enough to be reliable. Um, despite that fact, I mean, it is a paying gig. Yeah. So, uh, 
Yeah. Let's the end. take a pause for the cameras. <laughs> All right. Next up, how do you determine what is more likely to be closer to the truth when going through your sources? Do you know this one? I believe my thing would be I if you're able to cross reference it across multiple sources and or have dates match up or so the key the key golden standard is sourcing. Um, if someone can point to a primary source document that backs up what they're saying, like ordinance orders or things like that, which even then can be deceptive on, on in interpretation sometimes. Mm -hmm. But that's key. Uh, short of that, when you have people that make claims, which is Really common with the cult stuff. Mm -hmm. There's so many authors that just say things about cult and they don't tell me where they... And we have cult's letters, mm -hmm. but then you're also doing this game of like... This is a good one. Primary source would be this guy's referencing cult's letters. He's not telling you whether or not what he said this paragraph versus that paragraph is coming from a cult letter or something he made up. Right. Because uh, it's not cited. Mm -hmm. And then even if you assume all of what he said is coming from a cult letter, which is not... Right. Um... It's a cult letter, so he's lying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? You're like, how far away from the truth are we? And we yeah. saw how distorted the Browning story got before it was gone over by Gornstein. And Gornstein seems like he's got it tight because he says, hey, read, the, actually, if you, I'm not kidding. The, the, the Gornstein Browning book is something everyone who watches the show should read if you get the chance. Mm -hmm. It's very inexpensive, it's available now, and uh, it's new. And he does a lovely job of telling the story and also telling you the source of the story very organically as he's going through it. It's, it's, it's very trustworthy in that I read this and this led to that, you know, mm -hmm. beautifully done. I really appreciate it. Um, that would be an example of someone that's a high trust source because of the way he wrote. Now there's always going to be some faith that they're not making it this stuff up, but that helps. Mm -hmm. um, Cross-referencing is the other way. Which is that I will pull, if I can't get my hands on the primary source that they are citing, if I can pull multiple authors that are writing about the same thing and they're coming to the same conclusion from the same primary source, great. If they're coming to the same conclusion without the same primary source, great. If they're coming to the same conclusion but they're not telling me the source in either case, that's a little uh-oh. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know where it was actually cited. Is one just quoting the other? Or did they both read something somewhere else? And I mean, we we, we've seen that with uh, with the Krags, and people kept saying, "Yep, Krags were definitely used in World War One or uh, in uh, Europe." Europe, yes. Yeah, and it took forever because everybody kept saying it, and I kept going, "No one but kept sourcing where, 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 where." And the interesting thing is, I finally found a source for Krags existing in uh, France, France, theoretically front line, but more engineers in like one unit. Mm-hmm. And when I went back, because now that you have that thing, and I had a primary source for that, yep. I had to go back and look at all the other sources that said, oh, yeah, it was totally in World War I. I could not find a single claim of it being in World War I that actually referenced a primary document. Mm -hmm. So the primary document that I found was totally independent of every claim I had ever seen. Yep. Which is, did Wild. one of them know about that primary document, or did they just make it the F up and they got lucky? Yeah. How do you know? Um, but the trick is I didn't repeat any of it until I laid hands on it, which was another episode we stalled on forever was the crag because of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, finding the truth and, and trying to determine if something is the truth, very time consuming. And by the way, we're, I guarantee you not all of CNR's all primers are the truth because it's impossible to have the complete truth. It is utterly impossible the way human society and memory works. Mm -hmm. Uh, and document keeping is not perfect. Nope. However, we try to give you the best possible story that we can piece together from multiple sources. Yep. And I'm a little proud to say that on the uh, on the inside track, when I talk to other curators and things, the people that actually read this, mm -hmm. they so Watch far this. have been, the guys that are deep into it have been satisfied with the story we have put together. Or on rare occasion, it's a much older episode and, and more up-to-date information has come out. And that's why it's off is because it's just become outdated because of somebody unturning some stone that I didn't know about, you yep. know, five, six years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm happy with it. But boy, you are right. It takes a lot of sort of reading between the lines and trying to understand how far you trust a guy. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to citation, really. If he's really telling you where he's getting it from, that helps a lot more on the trust. Oh, yeah, 100%. Yeah. No. All right. Uh, any chance you guys will do a one-off shorter video series featuring clones of vintage custom or modified guns like what the Dillinger gang used for or used or uh, fit special revolvers? Um, I won't say no. Yeah. I've considered it. Okay. Uh, I've considered, you know, 
uh, filing for an SBS and doing a proper whip it. Uh huh. The problem with that is it kind of comes off incomplete because you can't always make all the modified pistols you want to make mm-hmm. without ruining stuff that's valuable. Uh, I could borrow a fit special because yeah. there's enough of those or fake fits. There's enough of those or fake fit specials out there that I, guns have already been ruined. Um, that's possible. Mm-hmm. I could do, uh, there is a group that was doing like 3D printed four ends for Winchester 1907s that could take Thompson grips. Okay. Yeah. So like I could do something like that without ruining a gun. Um, the problem is like the BAR that they were using that one. Cause they, they, they cut a BAR, which I don't oh, think I can get no. away with at all. Uh, that would be, unless I could just find another, but then. The barrel doesn't take down that way. No. Well, it does, but I have to find a barrel. I guess if mm. I found... That'd be tricky. Short yeah. answer is that's tricky. Uh, however, I do know there's a lot of like popular media around like whippets, especially. That would be an easier one to cover. Mm-hmm. Uh, the problem is, what do you say? Because essentially you're going... They, they, they had this gun, then they cut it down. Mm-hmm. And then they shot some people with it or not. And then you're out. So it's fun. It's fun to sort of be like, this is what they had. Boom, boom, boom. And you could kind of fit into a short, but I don't know that you could do like a primer on that unless like you said, you put them all together, but then you got to, that's a lot of work to get all the different ones just to fit into one episode. You're talking about the work, you're talking about the pre-work of, in terms of finding stuff of five episodes to make one episode. Yeah. But then there's not that much research in... If right. somebody you know has put together a collection and has it kind of in one place and I can just go work with it. That'd baller. be great, yeah. Yeah, we could do that. That'd be fine. Um, and I know somebody's going to say some museum, but I need to, shooting them is going to be what people care about. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do, too. Yeah. Um, next question. What's the status of the Hand Trap series? Still ongoing. We yeah. just haven't filmed it again. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's still there. It's, there's still traps to be filmed. It's just... Kevin won't come out of his cave. Yeah. And we're busy, too. Mm-hmm. So the comment... Neither one of us are doing a great job of getting it done. Mm-hmm. Also, it was very low view. Uh, I love the hand trap series. It's my oh, favorite thing we've ever done. Mm-hmm. But, boy, it had almost it had no economic impact on the channel other than net negative. Yep. Uh, in terms of cost and time and everything. But, boy, is it fun. Oh, yeah. It was a good... It was a good morale booster, actually, for both of us. We kind of needed that. Yeah, I sincerely love that 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 series, and I've considered some. We were talking about it. Um, uh, you're probably watching, actually, but we met a gentleman from the Clemson uh, shotgun team. Yes. And I was even after meeting with him, I was I was thinking, it'd be kind of fun to take some of the wacky traps and shotguns and just give them to like college dudes that shoot skeet for you know, competition, mm-hmm. but just be like, here, try to pull it off with this thing. And I'm going to go, what the heck? And here, have the other guy be like, here, throw it with this. Uh-huh. And then just watch them argue with each other, being like, dude, throw it straight. Dude, throw it. What, what are you doing? It's not even going out that way. It's going backwards. Yeah, just watch them argue yeah. with each other. Uh-huh. That'd be a lot of fun. That would be kind of fun. Yeah. Might want to try that. <laughs> but it is still ongoing. We'll just, we haven't re-geared it just yet. Yeah. All right, next question. Um... What is your favorite firearm for each member of the team post Vietnam era? Well, there's only two of us here. Yes, yeah, so I guess it's each member of the team right now. Uh, <laughs> post Vietnam era. Um, trying to even think. Yeah, you already got ARs by then, so now I'm going. I'm going white. That's not my era. No. Yeah. I can't. I honestly can't make a knowledgeable. Say okay. on that. I, think I don't I, really have anything post Vietnam era. That's the problem. I've shot a myriad of like people's concealed carry handguns. Well, that's but not that, thinking, like a concealed carry, but yeah, I've shot a myriad of modern handguns that people have handed me for me to go. Oh, I kind of like this. I kind of like that. Like I've done that. Yeah. In terms of rifles, I just occasionally get handed some specialty use DMR, you know, night vision oh. rigged whatever. You know, there's all sorts of stuff. But to what be about honest, your uh, sub two thousand. Oh, yeah, I do love my something. Yeah, that's pretty good. But I, 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 that's a favorite because it's a toy to me. I wouldn't call it... It's hard to say it's a favorite firearm. It's more like my favorite gimmick. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's more gimmick than firearm. I mean, that's fine. That could still be the favorite. Yeah. Yeah. What about Eddie? Can you think of anything modern that you really like shooting? I really like shooting. I mean, that's the problem is that maybe that... Um, it becomes too utilitarian. How about that VC 2008? That's true. You that's do like fun. that little guy. That was fun. I think I got bored of it, though. I did. 
but it was fun <laughs> for, for a while what? there. That's the problem is that we don't really shoot that much modern. To be fair though, the problem with that is it's supposed to be a VZ58. Yeah. No, yeah, 58, right? Uh-huh. Which would be pre-Vietnam era. It's just been made semi-automatic. Right. So you're somehow like, well, because they clipped it and imported it, now it's post-Vietnam. Yeah. Not really. <laughs> so that's the thing is it's like, um, we're old gun people. And I'm not that funny about it. I actually like a lot of modern firearms, but... I just don't really yeah, play with them that much. I think we covered it earlier. I, I kind of just stick to AR pattern for modern shooting. And then uh, a lot of the sort of specialty whatevers, they don't make an impact on me. Mm-mm. And then to be honest, I'd be struggling to be like, okay, when was the day we invented? You know what I mean? Uh-huh. And then even then the irons are weird, but, oh, you could get it with a rail now, but then that's weird that you have the rail on it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like It just, it gets weird. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to have to cop out and say I don't really have, I don't have enough experience to have a favorite in that era. Fair. What yeah. about, do you have a strong opinion? No, I, I already gave mine. I know you like the AUG. AUG was fun, but yeah. You fell off the AUG too? Yeah. I don't really have a favorite. May does this thing where she likes a gun hot for about 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And then two weeks later, she is over it. Yeah. I have no idea why she stuck around hanging out with me this long, because she gets fed up with stuff fast. Well, you must be still entertaining. <laughs> don't stop dancing. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> um, you mentioned certain objects having an emotional weight to them, and that attempting to capture the emotional weight present in the... In antique firearms was a part of why you wanted to do the show. In your experience, what constitutes that emotional weight to you, and to what extent is it transferable? Um, so there are things that draw you to antique firearms that may or may not also draw you to other things, e.g., vintage motorcycles, hand traps, what have you. So this is something that is not just cool. It has to have a density. Mm-hmm. And what he's referring to is, I talked about this, I remember people describing gravity as a rubber sheet. Have you heard this description? No. Okay, so the, 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 there's people who will describe the theory of gravity, and I don't, I don't know how accurate it is anymore, but I just heard this at one point long ago. Mm-hmm. They describe rabbit, gravity as, you have this rubber sheet, and it's pulled kind of tight, mm-hmm. but not super tight. Sure. And Or even like think of it like a trampoline. Mm-hmm. Right? And you take a... Uh, take kind of like a basketball or something, you put it on there, and it might be very big. Okay. But it doesn't really depress the sheet very much because mm-hmm. it doesn't weigh very much. Okay. And this is, you know, weight really is what we're talking about in this case, but it's enough to visualize the sort of distortion that it does in the sheet. Sure. Then you have, and it pulls things into it. If you were to put a marble by it, it would kind of pull it into it. Mm-hmm. Then you take this, like, bocce ball that's really dense, fill it with lead even, and you put it next to the basketball. Right. Even though it's smaller, it's... Then it's, it weighs more. It's going to pull the sheet down more, and the basketball is going to roll towards it. Okay. You know what I mean? And Where are you going with this? That same description is weirdly how I think about historical artifacts. Um, there are things that, when you understand them, when you understand what they are, they suddenly take on a density that is greater than just the size and shape of it. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, the size and shape of it in this case would be like when you said that some of the modern firearms, or modern-ish, the 49, Moss 4956 or SVT-40, mm-hmm. they look badass, right? Yes. That doesn't necessarily mean that they carry an emotional weight. They just look badass. They look intimidating. Right. But then you find out that they were in World War II, like the SVT-40. You go, this was in World War II with Russia. Mm-hmm. And then you go, oh. And that badassness is one thing, but then all of a sudden this historical weight this gravity of history starts hitting right. and that draw becomes stronger. And so that's what he's describing. Um, the question itself is how do I judge that? And does it apply to other things? I judge it by interest. It really is just this sort of emotional interest that you get in historical pieces and it affects some people more than others. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then does it apply to other things? Yes, of course it does. Um, it would, it, I would be far more impressed to see, like a World War One vintage Harley with its manual oil pump oh, and all that. Oh, that'd be amazing, yeah. Right? Um, doesn't mean I want to ride it, <laughs> but I'd love to see it, and I would put a lot of value on it to the point that I would keep it in pristine shape even though I can't ride it. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what I'm trying to sell here when I talk about that. Fair. I hope that made sense. And you're falling asleep. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, what's next? Uh, what's each of your preferred concealed carry setups? You don't have a preferred one still. No, I'm I'm just carried. I just have a little sig that I'm toting around right now, but it's yeah, not really not preferred. Favorite. Yeah, that's another time sink thing. May's never really made up her mind on a solid 
like what you prefer now because the market shifted. Yeah. And um, it's okay. You'll get there. Yeah. You won't get there. Do you need to tell your preferred? It's the same as it's been for years. People ask this a number of times, but um, I picked up a CZ75 compact with a decocker. Mm -hmm. And then actually, uh, I occasionally go on Fudbusters uh, this week in guns. Mm -hmm. um, which actually, I went on there before it was associated with Fudbusters. I've, I've gone on this week in guns for a number of years back when That's Sean true. was doing it. Now Matt I is. was even. Uh, <laughs> on it briefly and <laughs> you chased off that conservative host yep that, was, that was funny um poor may like embarrassed a grown man with her potty mouth one time i did and then um i was invited back after that <laughs> <laughs> but uh i forgot what we we're talking about um where was the you're concealed carry? Sorry, you're talking about three fun busters and, and you were talking yeah. to Matt. I, uh, I actually put a pair of VZ grips on it, which is a sponsor of the This Week in Guns podcast. Mm -hmm. And then, so whenever I'm on there, I go, I can legitimately say I've been using VZ grips for years. I didn't know they were VZ grips. I completely forgot that's where I bought them from until like we were looking at the, who's doing the sponsorship segment. And I went, this is like really familiar. And I did this search my old emails. And I went, oh yeah, I guess I did buy these from there. There's some G10 scales that are really aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, they're very aggressive. Yeah, I almost need a new pair because they've gotten kind of dull over the years. They yeah, like, they're... they like ground off skin on my side, they on my did. tummy. Yes. And it's like, I just am like rock solid right here. But um, <laughs> no, I carried that one because it's uh, for anybody curious as to why. Uh, I find it to be a comfortable firearm to shoot. The ergonomics are great. Low bore axis. I like hammer fire uh, if I can get it. And then I've had no mechanical problems. It's developed True. from the Petter pistols, essentially. It, it's in the same lineage as the SIG 210, but people just don't think about it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and in that particular instance, I have a number of features like a quick quick press check loaded chamber indicator and stuff like that where I can be assured of the condition of the firearm. Mm -hmm. I like the double single. Uh, I put in a Cajun Gunworks kit and that has given me excellent performance to the point that I have now two friends who have both swapped over the same setup, one of which was an extreme Glock fanboy. And yep. after shooting mine Cajun Gunworks out and everything like that, he went, mm, this is pretty nice. Mm -hmm. And the Ergos are really good for being compact and yet quick. Yep. So that's been a favorite. And then obviously just hit it with some night sights and you guys get the idea. Um, and I have beat the dog out of that gun. I mean, oh, yeah, you I, definitely it's, have. It's slowly losing its finish, but it has not had any problems with all the lint and other crap I pack into it. It's not. Um, we need to take a pause for the camera. Okay. Quick. Oh, and on the wrap of that, uh, I've used Alien... I always do this. It's Alien Gear, not Alien Wear, because that's the computer. Correct. Alien Gear. I've used Alien Gear two clip holsters forever. Um, I've yet to kill... I've, I'm on my first one still for, I don't know, how many years? It's been like it's, five years. Yeah. I've yet to kill it wearing it daily. Uh, and I had some buddies that blew theirs out, and they got them immediately replaced. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't think I've had one guy that blew his out. And then the other one just got some replacement parts because he lost the screws. But they've been great every time. Those guys have been super nice. Mm -hmm. So that's what I've done. All right. What's been your favorite episode project so far? Mm. Favorite episode I'm going to go for because project's kind of hard. Yeah. Because those are usually very involved and stressful in our parts. You say that, but the, this, this whole revolver patent project's been extremely illuminating. And it's been mine. That's true. Uh, I've been sharing been it with a yours. bunch of people, but it was like my impetus. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of fun to share with people too. Um, but I've really enjoyed the revolver project so far in terms of the research side because it's uh -huh. all of a sudden everything's stacking up. And it's stuff nobody's talked about. Right. So I like that a lot. That's That's been really sort of my getaway from... The, just the day in, day out episode crank. Sure. Um, mine might have been, I think I want to say the Swiss 1878. That was going to be my favorite episode. Really? Yeah. Why? I don't know. It's just at the top of my mind. What, what was at the top of your mind? Ah, it's so wacky and it's such a unique gun and it went very smoothly. It, it was, did. It was custom ammo, but it, Suze knocked it out. Yeah. And then the gun was all wacky, but it worked perfectly. Mm -hmm. It's, it's extremely easy to shoot firearm. I'm a little disappointed with how much smoke got in the way of the shot. Yeah. Oh, it sounds like a fire. It sounds like a truck. This is the mosquito truck. Oh, mosquito truck. Yeah. No mosquitoes. Yeah. Um, um, no, I actually, weirdly, uh, I, I lit on that too for a number of reasons. You know, the, the gun shot well, the ammo production went smoothly. Everything about the episode went very well. And then on top of that, I think that was one of the very first um, 
uh, times I stitched the animation together on my own. So my interpretation and understanding of the internal workings of that gun, it just from that day forward, that was the first one starting that just kind of... You started it, really understanding the mechanism. Right, exactly. Especially revolver. May is literate in revolvers. I think you might be... I would be amazed if there's a female on a planet that is uh, as literate in revolver lock works now just because you're stuck having to listen to me A lot talk of those old ones specifically. I don't know a lot of the modern ones they and all the craziness. They any different. Uh, Except for like the I've rhino. some weird stuff with the rhino. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's about thinking, it. That's, that's only really weird one. Oh, another rhino. Um, the, yeah, and the other one is the, with the Swiss 1878 is also that crux where right after that we really started cracking the Fanyu issue. Yes. But we were thankfully still correct about Warnet being the real designer of the Swiss 78. So it's like, it's weird, but we made the Swiss 82 right after that and kind of got it wrong because we weren't on the Fanyu question yet. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, it's obsolete and it's been two weeks and I'm the one that figured it out, which makes me mad. Right. But the 78 still holds really tight. So um, I don't know. I just, I really like that episode. Yeah, me too. It's totally boring. Nobody likes it. I like it. I'm a, one of my favorites. Yeah. Um, in the World War I era, there was, in some quarters of the public, uh, a feeling of resentment about those who designed and produced weapons to kill their fellow men. Have you ever grappled with this moral consideration? Have you grappled? Personally, um, not really, because there's, there's, there's times and issues in which things, people believe they're doing their things for the right reasons, or even if they're just doing them because they are going along with it. Um, that's... That's a separate time. There's separate considerations to be taken and there is separate reasonings that people had. I mean, I can't, I could go through and try to pick out individuals that, um, did it wrong or right. Yeah, I could do that, but it feels weird. Um, this is, so this is a very interesting thing. Uh, this is one of those scenarios where if you don't do it, the other guy is going to do it. You know, this is, this is the, prisoner dilemma of international politics, let alone regional politics, let alone raiding bands of uh, Scandinavians coming into Britain or whatever. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? This is the age old problem of man, which is that there are always people who are willing to take from others, uh, to inflict on others, whatever the case may be. And, and people will also turn anything into a, like they can turn anything into a weapon of destruction. Well, so that, that's the problem is the human beings are defined almost by two things. The fact that we are tool makers and the fact that we are, uh, reasoning beings. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we are still animals. Mm -hmm. So you are always like, unless we become something other than human, we are going to inflict violence on one another for good or bad reasons. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I guess the initial violence is almost never a good reason, but then retaliatory violence, it's weird. This gets really weird, right? Mm -hmm. There's, there's, the, there's a whole levels of ethics and philosophy built around this. The point being though is, we will be violent and we will make tools and we will make the tools better. So the escalation is inevitable. And then you start to get really crazy into like mutually assured destruction issues, you know, mm -hmm. which thankfully is not quite a firearms issue. Although after World War One, they kind of thought it would be. They thought World War One would be enough to end it. It was no. not. Um, Definitely was not. It's interesting that we've evolved to the point where we have weapons that theoretically should have ended war. And you know, everybody goes, look, let's just all agree not to use those and we'll keep killing each other anyway. So oh. in the face of that, I cannot possibly feel guilty about firearms because there's just so much else that can do the same job. Mm -hmm. And then I actually am a little proud of firearms and this this borderlines on the political. But I will say just as a, as a, a personal feeling of it, they are very egalitarian. Um, May probably knows this better than anyone else being mm -hmm. female. Mm -hmm. your chances of, despite being in better shape than I am mm -hmm. and having been athletic your whole life, whereas I've been a slob. Mm -hmm. If we go into a, a, a direct a combat, melee. Yeah. yeah be it if unarmed, we go into a combat, be it, I will lose. Be it unarmed, with a sword, a spear, whatever the case may be. Doesn't matter. Any weapon that is not a firearm yeah. or a grenade uh -huh. versus you versus me. The odds of my survival are still not great. Right. Yeah, no. If you and I go up against each other with firearms, uh -huh. it's a very level playing field. Oh, yeah. It levels it out pretty well. Yeah. Um, and so as a force multiplier for people who are smaller, weaker, older, female, whatever the case may be, it at least brought things more egalitarian. Yes. Assuming everybody has access. Now, there's always going to be a problem in which you have this, like, moral dilemma of who is allowed to be armed and who has to be disarmed. Mm -hmm. That is a much bigger question. Yep. But I think hopefully I've at least 
there's so much more we can talk about that, but hopefully that gives you a framework for where I'm at. Yeah. All right. Uh, ammo, and gun, ammo and gun prices um, be damned. What is your dream EDC? You don't know yet, do you? No, I don't have mine yet. I'm still playing around in the field, so I'm yeah. going to have to unfortunately defer this question. Uh, due to the limitations of our wardrobe and stuff, May's probably looking at subcompact. Like the Right now, the big debate is always everybody has the same question. It's like Springfield Hellcat versus... Um, I forgot the name of it. The one Doc carries. Oh, um... 365. Yes. The 365. Um, and that's like the big debate for anybody that is a small frame person mm -hmm. is that those two subcompacts because they're killing the market being double stacks semi oh, yeah, you of can't go considerable wrong with quality. That. That's pretty good. Um, especially if you get into the trigger jobs, you really start to go, okay, wait, which one? Mm -hmm. Um, interestingly enough, I don't know that either one of them is optimized to be low bore axis either. I think it's just that they are so compact. Yeah, I think so. Uh, for me, frankly, the money doesn't matter. I have yet to move off of my concealed carry because I'm completely happy with it. Mm -hmm. And I've experimented with a few things. So uh, I will only touch, in modern terms, I will only touch low bore axis pistols. I find yep. the bore axis to be influential enough in it's my true. personal experience that that is a do not pass go. So I get handed all sorts of like Walther, HK, Canik, you know, just... Everybody has their opinions about these awesome pistols in their minds. And when I grab a hold of them and that barrel is like three quarters of an inch above my index finger, mm -hmm. I already know it's not going to be everything they say it is. And I start shooting and nine millimeters is not that hot and the ergonomics are great on the grip and everything. And it feels pretty good. But I can, I don't, and maybe it's just my obsession that I can pick the flip. So my obsession is to get that low, that bore axis low. Mm -hmm. And realistically in that market, you have the CZs, which is not impossibly low but pretty low for what they are for when they were and then you get into stuff like the Steyrs, um which i really wish they would name those pistols it makes me so mad i heard that bubbits wanted to name them the draconi and they wouldn't let them so now they have to call it the m9 unless you're getting the 40 and then it's the m40 but unless it's not a medium then it's the l9 or the Steyr. Give it a name. Give the pistol a name. It's driving everybody crazy. Um, but as a striker fire pistol, I like those a lot, although there are some weird firing pin issues there mm -hmm. um, that they had got over eventually. But uh, other than that, you're getting into boutique, and I haven't shot a lot of the boutiques. So you're talking about like Hudson. You're talking about, um, was it Archon? I haven't gotten to shoot one of those yet. There's a number of low bore axis pistols I haven't had a chance to shoot. So I couldn't tell you that I would choose them over my current handgun because I haven't gotten to shoot them. Right. Um, and what it would be is it would really be a min-max game of trigger feel and recoil impulse and concealability. Yep. So uh, hopefully that helps, but I just I haven't had the time or money to go chase them all down to tell you the answer. And I will actually have to chase that down once I actually have the time to chase it down. <laughs> um, if you had a couple of hours on range time with no other pressing demands, um, I know Fat Chance, uh, what would you plink away with? I assume unlimited ammo and money. Yeah, and some, uh, unlimited ammo and money. Yes, okay. let's well, go with both of those things. What would you plink away with? Uh, can we be outdoor range, I guess? It's any range you want. It's any gun you want with unlimited ammo. What do you wish you had more time with? Probably shotguns in general. Just going out and shooting some play? Yeah, that'd be fun. Just unlimited time ammo. I invited you to go with me in the morning in like two days. Yeah, I'm probably going to be working. So again, I really, I'm going to help. I'll make up the time. I'll figure I, it out. Yeah, just okay. go with me. I'm just telling you. Just go with me. No. <laughs> I'll make time after the trip, but for the now, boys I get are stuff going. Done. I'll make time after the trip. <laughs> See, but this that, is how it happens. No, this is how I get stuff done. <laughs> <laughs> I do like I like around sporting plays if I can fit it and afford it. Um, that's the most pleasant, I guess, is just wandering around because you got the whole golf feel of wandering mm -hmm. and shooting. Yeah, but it if can I'm be a very sitting, casual day. If I'm sitting at the range and just just shooting to shoot, I don't know that it matters the gun so much. No. Um, right now, off the top of my head, I've been really meaning to work up loads for that Norwegian. I really want to see what I can get out of that Norwegian. Mm -hmm. So that's the one that comes to my mind first. But really, I just wish I had the time to sit down and get proficient at 700 plus on a lot of these guns. Fair. Um, but That'd it takes be... a fair amount of ammo consumption, a fair amount of time to do that. Yeah. So I do remember we uh, we were at that uh, IV-88 shoot that one time and they had, what was it, a thousand yards out? Uh, more than that, but yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking how much fun or neat that would be to take something 
maybe like bring out the Springfield 923 or something and see if you could actually just really walk it in. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, and that requires some ammo work too, though. Yes, it does. Um, You're not wrong. But yeah, I wish I, I wish I had the time to really. There's a lot of guys that do like uh, vintage uh, military shoots. And they're shooting at good ranges with them. And I kind of am envious that they have the time to do that. I would love to do that. Oh, yeah, me too. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Um, blah, blah, blah. What military center fire revolver is May's favorite for ergonomics and beardies for mass issue logistics? Okay, well, logistics on my answer is easy. It's the Bodeo. Mm -hmm. you, cannot, you cannot make a revolver cheaper, easier, and faster than that. Now, yours in terms of ergos. What's your favorite revolver to shoot? Probably the Abadie was pretty good. Really? Yeah. Huh. Why would you say huh? I thought you were like a Smith & Wesson K frame person. Yeah, they were not bad, but I mean, I actually really enjoyed, I enjoy weird things. That's kind of become more of my thing as I've gotten. So what about the Swiss 78? Yeah, the Swiss 78 was definitely unique. Um, what about the Swiss 82? Didn't care for the 82. 82 <laughs> sucks. Ah, <laughs> it was fast. 82 sucks so hard. No, um, it's 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 become more apparent as I've gotten more into these uh, older into these uh, into the show. The weirder weirder boys that stand out are the ones that I like the most. Yeah, yeah. Now it's weird that you and I both gravitate towards the Swiss seventy eight so much. Yeah, because there's nothing that remarkable about it, but no. it's just it's so cool. It really is. It's pretty rad. What about the top breaks? Do you like those? Um, yeah, but honestly, I kind of like the Fosberry. That's, it's different, it's unique yeah, as yeah, far yeah. as top breaks go. I want to shoot um, a Mauser zigzag. I haven't gotten to shoot I'd like one to yet. Try that. That'd be interesting, yeah. Um, i definitely like to try that one time. Because like a Fosberry that's not an auto. Oh, the auto. Simplex? Simplex would be neat. That's not a roll. Oh, no, it's not. I'm this sorry. This guy said revolver. Oh, my God. My brain. I'm yeah. sorry. I was thinking of a table that I saw two of those things on the same table one so, time. So, you know, um, yeah, you get the idea. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, I don't think... I don't think the zigzag is a semi-auto, but it uses the external grooves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you'd have to manually index the external grooves. I don't think we've gotten to do that yet in this no, show. No, I don't think so. But it'd be neat. Yeah. Is the mosquito truck coming by again? Yeah, it's double mosquito time. Jesus. All right, I don't know why you put a big space there. Um, is May still a fan of revolvers or has <laughs> needing to fire all of the ancient wheel guns uh, for the show soured her taste oh, for them? Oh, we broke her. Yeah, I don't quite love them like I used to. Um, now, you I, used my to love your K frame. Yeah, it's true, but my appreciation for them has greatly increased. Yeah. I now understanding more of the internal workings and and the intricate differences in designs. That appreciation has grown exponentially since yeah. we started the show. What about pulling the trigger? Pulling the trigger sucks now. <laughs> it just ah. isn't what it used to be. <laughs> My love for them has died in that respect. However, my appreciation for them and their their internal makings has has definitely, you know, Grinch heart big size growth. Okay. All right. Next question is also for you. <laughs> oh yeah, is May? Oh no. What guns is May fired that have worried her the most? I know your answer to this one. Well, the Vetterly. What? The Vetterly. I still worry with the Vetterlys. Yeah. Because you watched them blow up on me. Yeah, it wasn't great. And not then, not great. Um, I, but I know your other answer on this one, but I'm trying to think if there are any more. I don't... Because there's only one gun you had, a, a, a frankly... A well, near, yeah, the Swiss 93. Yeah. That was not my favorite. That was a weird day. I didn't care for that. I just kept overriding the bolt stop. This The spring that... that... that be, the, the other thing is you were miserable that day. I can't remember what it was. I don't know if you had a stomach bug or something, but you were absolutely dogged that day. You were exhausted... I think beat. I did have a stomach bug. But we, we shot a lot of you, you were rifles out, that day. You were out of sorts that day. Mm -hmm. And that is the only time in CNR National history that you have had, like, I want to call it a breakdown because I don't want to overrepresent it, but it's the only time you stopped working and went, I can't. Mm -hmm. And it was the Swiss 1893 carbine, mm -hmm. the straight pull. And it was the weirdest thing because you, you fired it and ripped that bolt out and it just came out in your hand and you went, what just happened? And because you were sort of goofy already, you're like, this thing's not safe to shoot. And I went, no, no, no. Let me take a look at it. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's just the bolt stop. The bolt is turning to lock. The firing pin literally can't reach the cartridge unless it's in lock. Yep. And you went, uh-huh, uh-huh. And it's like the Patrick Man Ray thing, the meme. Mm, or it's like, uh, it's that SpongeBob meme where it's like, okay, you agree that this is true. Yes. You agree that this is true. Yes. So 
this is definitely the result. And you go, no. And so we were on the range and I'm just going, I, I just. Right. It's, it's one of those things that I, where I mechanically understood it. However, the actual act of it still happening, that the bolt was still coming out was very unsettling to me. Yeah. And you were blown out emotionally. Like you were sick and tired and you were just like, I don't want to shoot it. And I said, we're behind. We need to shoot it. And I guarantee it's safe. Right. And you're just going. I need a minute. And it's the only time. Yeah, I time. took a minute to it's actually the, compose and, the, and reassess and you did, I mean, you, If I had said, okay, let's go home and we're missing an episode, you would have let me miss an episode. It's the only probably time I've seen not. you. No, really? Probably not. No. Really? You were pretty upset for a I minute. Was, I, require, I asked you for a, a minute to compose and just kind of reassess and then I went back to it. But no, I've never, I would never miss an episode for that. Okay. But it was. That, I would have probably died instead. It was totally illogical, but she was, she was fried. And, uh, Being ill uh, and then having to work is is quite troublesome sometimes for those. Oh but, yeah, I agree. I mean, hey, we're up until three thirty right now. We still have more more questions to go. But it's like it's you know what it was though more so than the Vetterly. You knew the risk of the Vetterly. Yeah. On this one, all of a sudden, it did something you didn't understand, and you went, "What is going on? I hate this gun." Mm-hmm. Like, you're so mad at it. Yeah. And with the exception of that, it actually ran pretty well. <laughs> there, actually, that's the fastest I've seen you do a turnaround. Because you're like, this thing's light. Oh, it's got a detachable bag. This is great. Like, she was all jazzed on it. And, like, one round ripped out the bolt and went, I hate this thing and I want to go home. <laughs> like, she was just like, <laughs> like, it went from, like, here to there. Yeah, never be sick on range with a fever. That does not help out. No. Oh, man. But I think those are the only two that were really like, oh, God. Yeah, I think so, actually. Yeah, probably. All right, well, let's take a pause for the cameras. Okay. Okay. Oh, um, nobody asked me, but mine. Yeah. Least favorite. Mm-hmm. Kaufman, which we don't have footage of. Oh, right. Yes. Cause uh, it... I assessed this revolver is perfectly in time. Mm-hmm. And for the, like the one time I didn't bench a gun and I go and it's four, five, five, I load one round, thankfully. And I boom and it kicks and it makes a click clack sound and I get hit in the head by a casing mm-hmm. and I'm going, how does this make any sense? And so what it had done is it had blown open, ejected the case, and snapped shut. And I went, okay, it's an auto-ejecting top break that <laughs> ditches all the rounds. So now I've got to figure out what about the spring tension allows it to, because it doesn't make any sense physically. Mm-hmm. And now I'm going, and it's still sitting in the drawer because I haven't gotten the time to figure out how I'm going to rework the springs to make it not do that. Yeah, no clue. So... Well, run around at Jexel. It was terrifying to shoot a gun and have the case come out of it when it's a revolver. Mm-hmm. You're like, that's not supposed to do that. No. All right, next question. What country's patent archives or museums would you want to check out in person the most? Liège, with Belgium. Yeah? Uh, there's so many things hidden in Belgium. Then I probably need to go and talk to people in person to do that. I probably need to learn more French. Oh, yeah, um, he would definitely need more French. Or have an interpreter with me everywhere I go. Lars is doing a jo- good job helping me there, but it's not the same as having me there. And uh, there's so much lost data in Belgium because there's oh, sort yeah. of this manufacturing capital. Uh, Britain was a manufacturing capital. We would have the data. Mm-hmm. The U.S. was a manufacturing capital. We have the data times two. Right. France was a manufacturing cable, ca- capital, but mostly for France. They didn't do a lot for everybody else. Um, occasionally they did, but... Not often. It's like Luffa show and a few other little things and yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and most of the time they were building them for outside sources in France so that you still have the documentation. Uh, there are some secrets in France that are hard to get out of France mm-hmm. because they're so protective of the documents, but not that critical compared to being in Belgium. Belgium would be the place to just, if you're talking about a country, Belgium is the place to do the research. Fair enough. All right, between Othias and May, who is a better shot? Probably you. You think so? I mean, you have more practice long range than I do. I would think that that would qualify you as the better shot. I think you're a faster shooter than I am, though. I'm, I'm trained on slow trigger pulls. I think I can do a tighter grouping, Yeah, but you're imminently more adaptable than I am. You will learn a method like this. And I would guarantee you if we both set up and just started hmm, training maybe. on something. If you and I both started training on snap shooting or tactical shooting, you would smoke me real fast. But... The problem is I am faster at you on interpretation of the bizarre. So you can give me a military rifle that's 100 years old plus and drop me on a 700 yard and I can take about five shots and be doped in for windage and everything else. 
and I can just hit steel at 600, just bang, bang, bang. Like, I can get real quick at figuring out where the deviations are. Mm-hmm. Um, and in a lot of cases, I'm fairly decent at not even seeing the impacts and still trying to work it out and just going, hmm, I don't know. Right. And I'm, I'm pretty smart at being able to quadrant and do other stuff than I So he just answered it probably him. No, long range, I think me, but short range, probably you. That's fair. Um... What is the crew's favorite shotgun, Marshall or commercial, and uh, thoughts on early adjustable chokes? Just mentable chokes. Yeah, just mentable chokes. Is that a word? Um, I don't have a ton of thoughts on early chokes because they were what was available at the time. Yeah. So it's the mosquito truck again. Yeah, it's going around. Yeah, around but why three around. times? What are they doing? Super mosquito time. That's weird. Yeah. Um. We're under attack by the mosquito truck. The But not mosquitoes. Do you have thoughts on early adjustable chokes? Let's start with there. No, none. Uh, I don't I'm not familiar with them. The only thing we really have is like a cuts compensator and I have an early I have a Mossberg frig, I can't think of the name. But it has the poly choke from Mo- not the poly, but whatever the Mossberg I can't remember the name of it. The adjustable choke from Mossberg. Sure. That's really all I've got to play with, and I haven't played with them enough to do any patterning or really really get a performance curve out of them. I uh, just usually leave them on full and shoot things from far away. Uh, so I don't have a ton of opinions there. Fair. Do you have a favorite shotgun? Um, I mean, I like that Winchester 1897. Yeah. That's pretty May fun. likes thin wrist 1897s. They're fun. Um, can you think of anything else that's a favorite shotgun? Mm, normal automatic boy. <laughs> the Hugrin? Yeah, just the gets cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, I don't like the Hugrin as much shooting it. I know. Mostly because the forein wants to wander. And I have a nice one, but it only has clamping force. It doesn't have an actual cross key. Oh, and so the forein cap always wants to wander off after you shoot 15 rounds. Mm-hmm. Uh, even with bird loads. And then, actually, my favorite shotguns are the Marlins. The 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 uh, external hammer Marlins. Well, like the 19S and stuff like that? Yeah, like all the, the, the 98, 17, 19, 24, whatever. They, they have so many iterations. Alphabet soup. Right. Um, That's the Marlins. They're extremely strong, and people have completely misinterpreted them to be dangerous, and yet they're they're way better than the Winchester 97. You know, I'm quite surprised. That I did not expect that to be your answer. Why? What did you think I was going to say? The, the obvious one. The one that people have seen the video on. The Burgess Folder. Burgess Fuller's wild, but it's actually really terrible. So I've done, we've been playing with Burgesses. There's actually one behind me somewhere. Yeah, there's one right over there. Mm -hmm. Burgesses have this thing where it requires the next round feeding to eject the, whatever case you just kicked out gets kicked out by the next round feeding almost exclusively. Mm -hmm. The pressure comes from it. So whenever you, whenever you're going nuts on one of those and you get to your last round, it stove pipes every time because it doesn't actually eject, Mm -hmm. which is really disrupting. Oh, yeah. And annoying. And I get why it's not a big deal back in the era before quick reloads. It's mm-hmm. just like, oh, yeah, jams on the last round. Who cares? But, God, it's annoying. Because you have to, like, pump it back open and flip it upside down to get it out of there. And then you can start reloading again. And it just drives me crazy. And then eventually one of these days we'll get to shooting the Alofs. Yeah, I got it running with paper shells. I can't get it to run with plastic. And that might just be a thing. Yeah. Um, one day. Yeah, and the Alofs is funky and cool. But to be honest with you, just in terms of shooting, I ran... Um, a sporting clay course, 100-something rounds, with a, a Marlin 17. And unfortunately, the timing is just a little out of whack, and my, my follower got in the way, so I need to go back and fix that. But that's a very minor fix compared to how rugged that gun is. Um, and people think they're unsafe to shoot, and they're not. There's this whole myth about them not being, like... Yeah, it's unfortunate that that's just kind of spread around. Yeah, there's a huge myth around those guns, and it's a complete misinterpretation, and they're inexpensive and extremely lightweight for their era. Like, they are some of the nicest weighted shotguns of their era, and they were absolutely, I have press, in 1897, announcing the release of the gun for the following year, before they had the inertia safeties or anything else like that, they said, these are designed for smokeless ammunition. Everybody says the 98 is black powder only. They're full of crap. The things were smokeless from the beginning. So they're they're perfectly fine. The problem is the very early ones don't have enough room for a star crimp shell. It's like you get a two and uh, right, two and three quarter star quarters. crimp. Can't do it. The star crimps open up more than a roll crimp did. And so when you try to eject it, it just jams because like it's just a little bit too long. crimps anyway. They look nicer. Yeah. So you, you if you have a really early one, then... Um, you're stuck with roll crimps or you have to file the, the ejector, you know? Mm-hmm. 
Um, next question. Do either of you have experience using Linksys? And if so, Linksys. what oh, distributions have you guys tried? Linux. Linux, whatever. <laughs> it's not a router. I don't know. Uh, I have I've made the deal. None. None. Yeah, I didn't think no, so. I, I did the Linksys one time. <laughs> uh, I have not used Linux in many years, but I, did, I do have a technology background. So uh, I think the last version of Linux that I really used was like Debian. So that would... That would hopefully date this for you. Did a Windows ninety five one time. <laughs> <laughs> Played I Lara have, Croft Tomb Raider. I I was such in college, and I'm you know I'm I'm old. Uh, so when I was you know I was in college in the very early two thousands, and so I had I was like everybody thought I was some sort of weirdo. Mm -hmm. I had the aim because I had a laptop in college, and it was one of the uh, one of the first micro books, the E machine, the triple E, mm -hmm. uh, which had like I don't know, like a four gig car memory card in it or whatever. Mm -hmm. and I was running this, you know, um, I can't remember which fork it was, but anyway, uh, I had one of those little bastards in college, and I would take notes on it because that's all it was really good for. But it was like having a a, a note taking machine instead of taking paper notes, mm -hmm. and I could, uh, you know, I could move files around and send emails if I needed to. Uh, on the college's Wi-Fi because they did have that, but they expected you to have this, these old big laptops like the IBMs. Mm -hmm. And everybody thought it was genius because I just had a little bag that I would keep it in. That was, I mean, it's the size of this thing but yeah. back then. And uh, that thing was great. But I think that's really when I kind of hopped off the special technology bus. I miss Windows XP. That was the best one. <laughs> XP was dope. I will give you credit. That was pretty good. But uh, no, you know what I did in college? Mm. But this is back when smartphones were, like, not a thing. Mm -hmm. One of the early ones was the Trio. And I was working uh, tech for a big company, and the CEOs would just burn through those Trios because they were garbage. So I remember taking two of them and uh, pulling, like, unsoldering parts and, like, putting them together. And I got one working one. And back then, you could just shove a SIM card in something and it would run. And so I managed to do that. And I had a, like, in college, I had a Trio, which was, like, very expensive at that mm -hmm. time. And, like, people were like, your phone can play music, you know. I mean, like it had it had a touch screen. If you're like, what? It has a stylus that's an antenna that's a touch screen, you know. And then now I regret all of it. We should have never done it. All that technology is garbage, and I hate it. Like I was cutting edge, and then all of a sudden, the, everything started spying on you. And I went, no, I don't want to play anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not playing. I'm done. Yeah. Um, what kind of watch does Matthias wear with a trench guard? Um, well, I don't have it on there. I know. I, I literally looked at your arms expecting it, and it's not there, but yeah. what is it? Uh, it's a Timex Weekender. Okay. Uh, the leather, the Crystal Guard was something that was available on eBay. I don't think the guy's around anymore. He's shipping them out of Hungary. And they're just sort of laser cut. Uh, to be fair, I've thought about trying to, there's another design I'd like to do. Uh -huh. And with my buddy with the laser, I'd really like to see if he'd knock it out. But the problem is you have to deform the metal to do it right. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was just a lasered thing or a cutout thing that I got off eBay. That was modernized to fit like a big 42 millimeter watch or 40 millimeter. I can't remember how big that thing is. But, uh, and then the Time Mix Weekender just came with a camo band. So I just stuck with that. Mm -hmm. And then I That's just. lasted you because of that guard. Yeah. I think I went on like Etsy or something and ordered a leather. It's called a Bund. B-U-N-D Delta. And um, it's called a leather Bund and you can just get them for watches. And so that's all I did is I just made one because what I wanted is I wanted it in, I wanted it analog I wanted it glow so I could read it at night and I wanted a crystal guard a because World War One stuff was kind of cool but B I frankly may can testify I have destroyed watches at a rate of about one a year yeah he has He's... from just gouging them I don't know why that's the only one that's lasted him now uh, because just, of the guard I gouge the crap out of him and I have to have him refinished or whatever and mm -hmm. it's like I'm just gonna get cheap weekender and it's been indestructible mm -hmm. so hundred percent. What's your favorite beer? Well, this now... This is a fun story. Well, okay, so now... What was it before? Before, it was... Um, that's technically Miller Lite. <laughs> oh, God. You had a thing where you were into Belgian sours for a I while. was, and then all of a sudden, I remember, I think one day I had whatever the Golden Monkey one is, and I just took a sip. Something felt wrong. I put it down, and I haven't had a sour since. <laughs> yeah, Melee reached this peak level, and then this the uh, the small town Southern just kept creeping back in, and you just gotten back to your redneck roots. Yeah, because you were you were in it used the, to be Miller Lite, or then it went to Miller Lite, and then now it's kind of in Blue Moon with the uh, orange. I remember what broke you. The bug. Yeah, I we got sick, and then you got the bug. Taste buds just took a while to recover, and. 
something about orange and citrus kind of really broke through anything. And that and pickle onion. God. Loved pickle. I still love it, but dang, that that yeah. really broke through. May has slow taste recovery, and uh, citrus worked. So you yeah. could add citrus to things, and all of a sudden, it would taste it normal made again. Cooking really difficult. Yeah, you just basically had to add like lime I or go by orange. Smell. I mean, and think. I think this tastes good. It smells pretty good. Yeah, but because Blue Moon around here gets served with an orange, and she was doing the citrus thing, I was like, here, just have some Blue Moon. It's got orange in it anyway. Because I always liked it. Because mm-hmm. I like half of Ison's. So, like, uh, what is it called? Pinkers? Pinkus? I can't remember. Mm. I haven't had it in years, but there was an unfiltered half I used to like, but I can never get it now. It's either Pinkers or Pinkus. And then because I could never get it, uh, when Blue Moon became popular in South Carolina, I just kind of switched to it. It's always available. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, I, I'm mm-hmm. not a heavy drinker anyway. So Me I, neither. I, I'm lucky to finish one beer in an evening. I'll, I'll get into a habit where I'll, I'll be having a beer every night, and then... I'll run out of beer and forget to grab some, and then I won't have one for two months. Yeah, and I'm like it's kind of the state I'm in now. I think on Friday night I drink like one beer, and that's my weekly beer. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it, out of a range of things that's available, I'll pick the Hefeweizen usually. Um, just it's been my preference. I can't say why. Yeah. I'm not an IPA man. Um, but yeah, May for whatever reason locked onto that because she goes. Why does this taste different? Why does it taste better? And then ever since the uh, ever since the bug, May has just been completely happy with like Love every, it. You I'll still get excited every slices. time. Yeah. She'll just throw two orange slices in there and be like, this is so good. And she just like, like you keep so reimagining how much you love it. I knew. It's it's actually kind of nice. Yeah. I really like it. Uh, and then both of us, it's not beer, but both of us tend to actually like sakes. Oh, yeah. It's true. But much like the unfiltered Hefeweizens, I like unfiltered sakes too. Yeah, that's pretty good. So like Nigori's. Been trying all those. Although there's some dog nigoris. While watching uh, The Laughing Salesman. <laughs> ten minutes long. That's like all we can fit in. Can't watch half an hour or something. That's Gotta watch much, ten minutes. I mean, that's how long it takes you to get through a small little cup of sake, too. Yeah, yeah. So that's fine. Done. Um, let's do this and we'll, and we'll take a break. Um, my roommate always says, oh, the hipster gun show, because you're apparently now the arbitrator of these things. Are we? Yeah. What is the ultimate hipster gun brand? Uh, there's a hipster gun brand? Oh, probably, um, kel No, that's not hipster. That's Buck Wild. That's schizo stuff. Well, that's what I think of as hipster. I don't know. Everybody accuses CZ of being the hipster gun brand. Yeah, they kind of do. You know, you're right. But they don't really do hipster things. That's, no. that's It's weird. I understand that hipsters like CZ, but does that make them the hipster gun brand? Because CZ is actually fairly solid. Like... They don't make a lot of... You know, maybe it's the chicken and the egg situation. Does the hipster make it, or do they make the hipster? I don't know. is a fairly conservative firearms company in terms of their product, and they deliver good quality, and it's pretty straightforward. But I wouldn't say that it's got that, that sort of, like, pretentiousness that I imagine with hipsters, where it's just like, well, this is superior, you know? With my ascot. Yeah, and so... Or at least the hipsters I remember from <laughs> back in the day. ascots on a gun. It's, should, it's hipster. Uh, my old roommate, Snyder... <laughs> That what he would like is what I always think of, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? And I feel like he would get into HK. Yeah. I just, my intuition is HK would be the hipster shit because it costs a little too much and the controls are a little weird for no reason. And But it's better that way. You just got to understand it. You know what I mean? That's. You know that. I could see that. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I'm more of a thinker. You're more of a doer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we actually got time for one. I highly doubt Snyder's watching, but. He would know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, can we get a chibi clay witch pin? No. I'm sorry, no. This is, it's gotta be a little Sal. Sal, the patches really didn't do all that hot either. Yeah, it's amazing. They, they really didn't do great. So, it's, it's kind of unfortunate, but it just wouldn't be really worth the cost it's to It's gonna be a universal to product. It. Yeah, that, that's the thing is we gotta make it worth the actual production amount for an increased amount of a product. Because we, we pre-purchase. It's not print as you go, essentially. Yeah, we're also smaller than you think. We are. So, camera? Yes, cameras. By the way, there's a number of CNR cell products I want. Oh, yeah, me too. But it's just unrealistic to, to make them in volume. We just lose money. Oh, you might want to raise your mic. You're you're really quiet. Am I? Uh, well, see there. No. You're looking down. Yeah, but then I, ra- I start yelling. Oh, okay, Trust me, fine. if I start yelling, okay, yeah, you're fine we've had now. this problem. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, what do we got? Um, okay, so if you had to choose only one video game to play for the rest of your life. Rest of your life. So, okay, shit. What would it be and why? Wait, can oh, I guarantee... Hold up. Can I guarantee that it's not going to get screwed? Because I'll take back Titanfall 2. I'll take that back. Because if it doesn't God, get screwed with all the hackers and stuff... Too. Yeah. 
I was I was good at that. And you were really good at Titanfall. Which is Titanfall 2 specifically. You were good at both of them. Well, I was good at both of them. But then the smart pistol in the first one kind of screwed Like you were top three repeatedly in Titanfall, which is a very acrobatic game. Yes. And I I heavily I thoroughly missed that game too. I really I used do. to smoke that game, but the problem is something broke me making the show. Mm-hmm. And the I don't know what happened, but the position. I, no, it's not even that. I can play and I can whip around, but something has changed where if I get really intense on a game, I get a little too much anxiety. Like I get the shakes like I've been drinking too much coffee. Mm-hmm. Even though I'm enjoying myself, I start getting like uncomfortable bodily. Mm-hmm. And I don't know what happened to me, but it really ruined the... And it's actually kind of stressful because I used to sort of mentally dump by playing very high intensity games and very competitive games. And now I can't do it because it actually raises my anxiety instead of lowering it. And I have no idea why. I, I don't know what caught me that or how to change it. interesting. Yeah, no clue. Yeah, but it just won't go away. And so now I can only kind of play casually. And to be honest with you, playing casually is kind of boring. So I actually have not really been playing video games. Mm -hmm. I mean, you um, and I can play it something together that's constructive. But that's about the extent. So there's two kinds of games that I would realistically play, which is like, this sort of build it up game. Mm -hmm. Now that could be anything from a basic Minecraft thing to like a, a historical strategy game or something. Sure. But the let's call it a broad category of build them up games. Build them up games. I have no time to play those. None. Yeah, they take so a that's, lot of time. That's off the board because there's no chance to enjoy them for 10 minutes at a time. And then the other half of what I play is just weird garbage that I laugh at with my friends. And I haven't even done that for an entire year probably now. But like... Sop is the one asking this. I believe Sop was one of the ones that's playing like barbecue simulator and stuff with us. But the thing is, here's the thing. He's saying you could play this game. It's the only one video game you could choose to play for the rest of your life. Right. So you literally can't pick another one. Right. I don't even know what you could pick then in those Well, you two said categories. Titanfall. You picked yours. Yeah. Assuming that there's a playable base with it. Mm -hmm. um, I honestly couldn't pick because the, to be truthful with you, I might not play another video game for the rest. Right now, I can't perceive playing a video game. Again, like my Steam account's been sitting there just inactive forever. Yeah, you'll look, you'll look through this the search stuff, but that's about it. Yeah, I've, I've, I have a weird habit of checking the discovery queue. It got mad at you that one time and just recommended time, garbage stuff. It just recommends pornography to me all the time now. It's so weird. It's just, I don't know what I did. Well, you've to been my, over 14,000 things. I have things. never bought a porno pornographic game ever. Uh-huh. And um, the, the Steam interface will show me, if I click next, it'll just boom, like balls, vagina, whatever, right? Uh -huh. But then I'll click next again, and it'll be like, oh, enter your age to see this content. It's a AAA title in which somebody bleeds. And I'm going, Steam, what are you doing? Like, how did I end up in this scenario? Like, did I click something weird five years ago, and I don't know what I did? Uh -huh. But like, no, it just straight up shows me porn, but then it hides violence. And I'm just going... This is weird. Yeah. And I've never gone in to try to figure it out because I just clicked the thing and I go on. But right. I've reviewed like 16,000 titles because it's just a habit when I'm bored to just sort of click it's like true. 20 of them and just see what's going on. Yeah. Um, but no, I, sorry, Sop. I don't know, man. Like, I'm so disappointed in gaming right now because A, I can't do the high intensity and B, there's nothing that's sort of quick and easy and multiplayer because I also want to see my friends. I will say, I guess if I had to pick one that I would not delete off my Steam, if I had to delete everything I have on Steam but one, mm -hmm. golf with your friends. You're not wrong. Because on a rare occasion, I'll get a night where I have some time and I'll just go on our Discord and I'll just be like, it's golf night and we'll just go play golf with your friends with like 10 people. Oh, yeah. And That's great. I always turn collision on and it's just grown men screaming at each other for smacking their balls oh, at each other. It's grown men screaming at each other and then grown men screaming at Henry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Henry. Because Henry, Henry will drop random stuff. Although that one night, it was great. I kept framing Henry because he was right next to me. <laughs> and Jameson was getting so mad and worked up. Yeah. And then he found out later it was me and he was like, man. <laughs> so I guess in a pinch, golf with your friends. Because at least... Um, because uh, everybody on the Discord can play it. It's really light on the computer. And uh, Tau Flater Mouse from Tau Flater Mouse. He's good at it. it will, he, he will play it. He's very... And, he plays it to get win. he pissed off, too. Because, oh, yeah, he plays to win. And when we put Collision on, he gets so mad. Oh, my God. It's so I funny. love it. It's great. Yeah, I should I probably want to play that right now. I highly recommend Golf with Your Friends. We, once we get back and we get caught up, we're playing some Golf with Your Friends. <laughs> okay. Okay. Always join the Discord, by the way. Our Discord is open to the public. Yeah. Again, bottom of the Scene Arsenal website, click the little icon. Yeah, that's it. Oh, God. We're going to have like a dozen people joining. That's fine. 
Um, Look, we got enough people there to beat him in the submission now. So I, I believe this was a question because it was separate. Rising Storm 2 or War Thunder for sure? Is this answering SOP? Or? I, I, it, it, it was underneath his, I think, but it wasn't a response to him. So I don't know. I and it, this I, is the only thing he put. I demoed War Thunder for like an hour and just could not get into it. Was that the one with the planes? Yeah. I tried that. I, I couldn't to, get into it. When I was it. a kid, I loved aviation games, and I just can't get back into them. I've never been in, in, in that, able to do aviation that much. Saying that, in Battlefield 1, I actually, my top vehicle is now the giant plane, which I don't know the name of because I don't care to name, learn the names of stuff in that game. The bomber <laughs> or the Gotha bomber? The, the big one. Yeah, yeah. Whatever the biggest plane the is. Yeah, I'm, I'm really good at that because I don't when know Titanfall why. When Titanfall 2 went to crap, I told me just play on the Battlefield 1 servers and it's too it's slow. So slow. She hates how slow it is, but she'll still play it. Yeah, it's fine. I never get to look. You, that's your... Whatever. See, I'll go read some fiction or something in between doing stuff uh, to give me like a 10 minute break. May just plays one half round of like BF1. Although I haven't played that since last month, so... Yeah. It's fine. Um, But I did play Rising Storm Oh yeah, we did try lot. Rising Storm 2 a little bit. No, wait. Is it Rising? No, I what played Rising it? Storm 1 a lot. Yeah, you played 1. I played a crap ton of Rising Storm 1. Is 2 Vietnam? Wait, we did do 2 a lot. Remember? Because... I can't remember now. Yeah, we, we played 2 a bunch. I remember I played it with you. Which one's the one that was Vietnam and which one's the one that's Arisaka's? That's what I thought, was, I thought was Arisaka's. I think it's Rising Storm. I thought it was Rising Storm 2. I don't remember. I played the one with Arisaka's a I lot. I played that one more. Yes. And then I played some of the Vietnam one, but not as much. I wasn't that great at it. I was like, okay at it. My problem with those is they need more destructible environment. Yeah. Slash, there needs to be a way to change the map because once you, those maps became so um, overthought and so static that people would just do the same thing every time. Yeah, and it so got kind the, of boring. There needs to be a dynamic element to the maps or else the game just kind of falls into the exact same tropes every time. Which would happen with Counter-Strike back in the day. Yeah. You just, there's only so many ways to play the maps. So I miss, I miss uh, all the times that we did with Battlefield Bad Company 2. Yeah. That was a good one. I was shooting uh, helicopters two. out of the air with tanks. That was my favorite. That Company 2 is probably the best multiplayer experience I've ever had. Oh, that was great. It's just so good. We played that for eight hours one time. They back kind of the blur day. together, though. Which one was the one where you could just throw C4 to the on the UAV and they never patched it? Which one I was that? Know. It was one of the bad remember. companies, I thought. There was one of the, one of the ones, like, if you had the UAV drone, uh -huh. you could then have a demo guy just stick a bunch of C4 on it. And so what you do is you stack your quad with just you stack your squad with a guy with ammo, a guy with C four, and a guy with the UAV. And you would just like in order to 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 get to the enemy objective, you would just load the drone with C four and fly it in, and just land it on the crate and blow it. And this is on Xbox or something, so like not as heavily interneted as the PC version. Correct. Yes. Um, and just the number of people who didn't figure that out, like I think we were the only ones doing it for almost six months. That's amazing. It was actually. so funny though. Um, as connoisseurs of all things 90s, what's the best snack food from that time that is no longer produced that you would want back? That was no longer produced, but you want back. I can't answer this. I don't remember anything from the 90s that isn't still being produced. Oh, there's a lot of Dunkaroos. We were joking about that. They're still around. Uh, Matt and I were talking about Dunkaroos. No, Dunkaroos went away. And then I guess they theoretically came back, but they went away. And Are the Dunkaroos now not the same Dunkaroos? I don't know. I haven't tried them. Yes, you have. I bought some. You bought Dunkaroos or you bought something similar to Dunkaroos? It's the purple blue colored. I don't remember. <sighs> to be fair, I didn't have a lot of Dunkaroos as a kid. I saw some in the grocery store and then I thought, oh, I'm going to buy some. And then I went, oh, wait. I thought this is kind of neutral. Most of the snacks that I had as a kid are still around mm -hmm. that I liked. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't like them anymore because they're too sweet. Mm -hmm. And then the stuff that disappeared really wasn't my, I, like people really freaked out about Surge going and coming back. Surge wasn't my favorite as a kid. Oh, I did remember Surge coming back. I like that. that was yeah, David good. got excited, but I just, I wasn't, I, was, I mean, it was cool, but I wasn't, I didn't really like Ecto Cooler that everybody liked. Like it wasn't my favorite. The Coke coffee was okay. Gross gross and you were wrong i got a lot of that because a lot of people did not care for it and Coke. they had to buy a six pack of it so i ended up with a lot of it at one point just oh, in like my locker it was so gross god it was so gross all right it wasn't my favorite but it was it passed Not even time. 90s that's 2000s because i was around whatever um i'm really struggling there's probably something i'm missing and i just don't mm -hmm. remember it's more of the tv shows that i i miss than the food i still eat a lunchable on occasion 
It's the true. I, I'll keep them in the fridge sometimes. <laughs> it's gross. Well, actually, it's weird. The ham and cheese ones are easy. If you have an upset stomach, they're easy on the stomach, and you they can are. get them at the gas station. And uh, they they very much are good in that they're peanut free. So any allergies, it's kind of easier to handle. The pizza ones are gross. I love the pizza ones. I you still and eat I, those. May and I, May was May was having, those Rob was in town. May was having range. a rough time for a while there. Like you were just tired of it. Mm-hmm. And I remember what I came up with, and now we can't do it because the grocery stores don't stay open late enough. Right. May we get depressed in the middle of the night. Not depressed, but just like sick of it because we were mm-hmm. working all night. And so I came up with adult Lunchables. Yes. So we would go to the grocery store and buy these like pita flatbread things. I forget what they're called. But there's like but this, the round pitas. There's they're, these round, no, yeah. not pitas. They're like a flatbread. Um, but they're smushy. I don't know what yeah. they call them. Somewhere, I don't know. Anyway, it's a smushy, bready thing that's like it's this a big. Pita. Um. It's a pita. Pita's thinner than that. Anyway. Yeah, but the, this is the American version of a pita. I forget what they're called. We buy those. Pitas. A jar of tomato sauce, some Mexican cheese or whatever, mm-hmm. or, or Swiss or whatever we want, yeah. and a pack of pepperonis. Yeah. And I'd be like, look, it's adult Lunchables. And, like, I came up with it one night just to cheer up, and she was so happy. Yeah. And then we just did that for a while. And then, to be honest with you, the problem is now grocery stores close earlier here. Ever since the oh, bug. Oh, yeah, they never open back up later. So, like, I would do it right now, but there's literally no grocery store open right it's now where true. we are. Um, if anything, know. by the time we're done with this, the we can get the early open. man breakfast. It's almost, it's four. Do you want to? Kind of tempted. We've never gotten to do it in a long time. What do you want to, where would we go for the it? The trotters? We could try that. We go to the trotters. Okay, we'll think about it. We'll okay, see how anyway. we get. Usually <laughs> around, on. usually around 5 a.m., he kind of goes... Nah, so we'll no, see how it. things I'll happen. We'll, um, see, we'll see what happens. Although I have to get up early, to, not tomorrow, but tomorrow. Yeah, did you really think you were going to go to bed? No, because it's 4 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all. We are dedicated. Yeah. We get the shit hey, some done. Some of them are listening to it. We're, we're insane. We get this shit done. Some of y'all marath- the- are y'all marathoning this with us? Who, who's been here from the beginning? If you've been here since we started... Good on you. I'm <laughs> poor, proud. You poor monster. You have the um, pride of May that you carry <laughs> with you, which is something that not a lot of people have. I, I know you point reached out. your limit. Or are you just buying time now so that you can go to Trotters? I really don't like him thinking about this kind of stuff. Okay. What's next? It's um, kind of a bad name for a restaurant, Trotters. Sounds not like a good thing. I kind of like that as a result. <laughs> What's your favorite candy? Uh, do you have a favorite candy? You know... Pause for a second. You you think of yours. I, I gotta think of mine for a second. I think of mine or I say mine. Say yours. Uh you know what? I grew up What do you define as candy? Candy. Like a, a, a candy bar? Are we talking um something sweet? A, Jesus sweet woman, have treat? you forgotten what candy is? <laughs> I'm just I'm trying to make sure I get this right. Okay. Because I have a hard time with candy. There's no candy sweeter than me. Damn. That's so not true. <laughs> yes, not at all. Not even remotely. No, he's very angry and I'm scared. Um, it says as, he, as I'm the one that feeds him. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, can't, that's not true. I eat out sometimes. Good meatball stroganoff the other night. Amazing. It's amazing. fresh dill. You guys don't want to know this. In Once the, you go to fresh dill, it's hard to go back to anything else. May couldn't cook, like, May could barely boil spaghetti when it's we true. started the show. I was over boiling spaghetti. Right. And then something happened in the middle of producing Scene Arsenal where she was just like, I'm going to learn to cook on top of everything else. And now I have, we have, I'm not kidding. With just like just a little of training, Michelin chef. Because, I mean, she's amazing. Well, I just, I like making things well. And I write down what I've done and the changes I plan to make next time. And then I just do that. There are, and then I just, there's several things that have iterations. Th- there are restaurants in Charleston, which is a highly competitive food world. And she will go there and eat their signature whatever and go, it needs something else. And the next thing I know, two weeks later, she's like developed her own version of it that is superior. And then I go, well, great. Now I can't eat there anymore. Thanks, May. Well, not with everything. It's only been with a few things. Anyway. But I'm very happy with those few things. <laughs> They've come out really good. And the restaurants gave me the ideas. So that's really Your cool. Your limitation is Asian. You can't duplicate like Asian version. I'm gonna get there. I'm I'm figuring out uh, my fried rice is getting up there. Your Tom guy is amazing. I'll give yeah, you that. that that's gotten really good. Okay, so what were, what we're talking, we're about, talking about, candy. about favorite candy. You didn't pick a candy. I'm we are sure. not answering the question. I'm, we are answering non asked questions. I'm really bad at candy because I don't really like candy. What do you mean candy? I don't really eat what well, I don't What's eat. What's the last candy. candy you ate? See, I can't do this. Do you like what? chocolate? Yeah, but not really. I don't Did you really like all eat. those freeze dried things you ate? Freeze dried things? The hell are you talking about? You found them at the flea market when we were at the show shows. 
Oh. Yeah, but I don't, they're not my favorite. Freeze dried Charleston chews made you pretty happy. Yeah, but I just thought they were good. I just didn't really. What about, ta- what about chewy for. candies? You like gummies? Yeah. Mm. You like gummies, okay? Does, does sugar free Red Bull count as my candy? No, it doesn't count as a candy. That's disgusting, and you're going to get cancer. Uh, what's and a an candy ulcer. I've eaten? Oh, oh, I like peach buds. I like peach buds a lot. What's peach buds. Oh my God. I love peach buds. What are peach buds? I haven't had peach buds, and I think. 15 years. Is it a peach flavored candy? Oh my God. Yeah, they're amazing. Wow, I really want a peach bud. <laughs> what is a peach bud? <laughs> I'll show you after this. But to be fair, it's probably taste. Does it taste similar? Wow. Does it taste similar to a uh, Hanunoku I want a peach bud so bad right now. What did uh, you just say? <laughs> can, can we turn back the recording? Because I don't know what the hell you just said. You've gone past the exhaustion <laughs> point because <laughs> all of a sudden you have just like shifted. I'm so hot right now. It's so warm in here. <laughs> <laughs> what is going on? Are you breaking down from like yes, fatigue? Yes, I think so. But what did you just say? Hana no kichiduke. No, that's not. What is that Asian word? The pink flower kiss candies. Nope. They're peach flavored. Ah, uh, nope. I've given them to you before. They come in pastel wrappers. I forgot. I don't know what those are. Oh my god! I'll get you more. You like them, I remember. But I like that. peach buds. Those are amazing. What is What's a peach bud? Is it a hard candy? Run out of time. You aren't describing it. What is a peach bud? It tastes like peaches. It's in a little bud form, and it comes in a in a in a brown. Is it a hard candy? Yes, sort it's of. It's probably the same as Hanunoku Chiduke. No, it's all the same. Because I like those too. They're like you a can cre- get them at the fresh market. They're creamy peach in flavored. South Carolina. They're creamy peach flavored candy from They're Japan. Not creamy. No, I'm telling you what. Never mind. I don't care what those are. I like peach buds. So weirdly, I was gonna say them because they are like it's a Japanese peach flavored candy that I find to be tasty. Although no. I don't eat a lot of sweets. Um, Peaches are the one sweet thing I really like. I will say. One of the things I loved as a kid that I'm not sure because I haven't had them in a while. Remember those ones that are like strawberry flavored in the, in the strawberry colored wrapper? It looks like a little strawberry. <gasps> yes, and it's got those. the cream. It's got the strawberry creamy hey, you can thing still in the get middle. Those? Yeah, I do, I'm sure you can get them. I haven't had one in a while. Oh, you want one? Do you have one? No. Well, I'm just saying I'll grab you some. I don't know that I want. I'm already. If fat, I, had I don't one need in my more candy. And pulled it out. There's nothing about How this that awesome says add candy. Been. Okay. This is this is son's candy and it's this bad. Don't give me any candy. All right. But probably I used to love those as a kid. I'll just leave one on his desk someday. Okay. Anyway, we gotta let's, go. To the... Let's pause the camera. Yeah, because you're not answering any questions. All right. What's your favorite sandwich? <laughs> you're losing you so fast. What's your favorite sandwich? No, you gotta name the sandwich first. They're not gonna like my answer, and I think I've told this answer before. Oh God, you're gonna say that thing, aren't you? Well, it is my favorite sandwich. Okay. I just don't eat it very often. Uh huh. But I don't make sandwiches very often either. This is when this is I this is when May's hometown kicks in. I like banana and mayonnaise sandwiches. Oh, there's the Carolina. So I grew up with them with Hellman's, which I kind of still prefer. But Duke's makes an excellent uh, mayonnaise substitute. Mayonnaise used too. So you know, Hellman's or Duke's uh, banana mayonnaise sandwich. Should add some white cheddar to that because it's all the same color anyway. No. Don't add anything else to that. It's perfect as is. I've heard of this weird peanut Gross. butter banana sandwich. Eh, she doesn't fry not them my either. Favorite. That, you're all thinking fried. Well, yeah, it's interesting. Some, some. That was how my uh, Nana did them, and I didn't care for that. So I asked her not to fry mine. So mine are just normal. They're good that way. I prefer them that way. Hunter, what is your favorite Hunter sandwich? Lunatic. It's not that weird. I mean, think What's about my people favorite? Do what do you think my favorite sandwich is? Uh, probably a Reuben. Yeah, I would lean towards a Reuben. But it's hard to say because I don't always want a Reuben. It's just that I tend to go back to them more often. Than you other also things. like a roast beef dips. You know, like that with an Yeah. Yeah. You'll go for that. But um, honestly, you've been going for things more pickle with some pickling in there lately. So if you think about uh, like a good Alvin Ward sandwich. That oh, we... a good bon me. Oh, good bon me. Yeah, you will love good those. Good bon me. Yeah. An Italian style uh, sub. I mean, I, there's a number of sandwiches I like. Double meatball sub. I actually like a meatball sub. Mm-hmm. Don't meatball sub. But there's that with spaghetti sauce will kill you. Oh, yeah. Um, well, it kills you. I'm, I'm fine. In a pinch, I'm probably just going to go with like a deli with some Italian dressing and just some mixed lunch meat and shredded whatever in a pinch. Sure. Um, but, you know, I'm, I guess I'm not that married to one sandwich. That's fair. If someone is armed to the teeth, does that mean they have more firearms than teeth? Armed to the teeth means that you would 
have armaments in, including in your mouth? Because it predates firearms, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, or maybe you had arms all the way up to your teeth? Like you just... I don't know. I don't know where that phrase comes from. Maybe you're armed... Oh, you have so much ammo, it goes all the way... Yeah, maybe it goes all the way up to your teeth. But I mean, armed to teeth has to predate firearms, right? I don't think so. I um, Watch it be like a cockney rhyming thing, and I just don't know that. Scrap on, oh, damn. Um, I explained that when we were at that show shows. I explained cockney rhyming scheme to people, and they got so mad. Because yeah. they were just like, this is bullshit. How can you... It's, just, it's pure memorization. Mm-hmm. And they, were just, they hated it. Yeah, that's fair. All right, next question. If you're given a million dollars for yourself or the show, what would you do with it? Land. Land. Shootable land with, that I can live on. That you can live on specifically. Yeah, because we it's didn't have to commute an hour and a damn half just to And film. we could just walk outside of the backyard, test something. Right. Or film something. We, when we started this, we did not know we were going to go into like a completely locked real estate market that would be utterly impenetrable to people that are running on a very narrow margin. So... Our chances at land investment are like, you know, and so it's not that we're poor. It's just that we are in exactly the wrong position to be buying property. Mm-hmm. And so. And we, property that is close by and or livable. We could have. You know, if we hadn't picked this place, we could have picked a place with the land and done everything. Yes. And we should have. But we hedged on this because we thought, well, we'll just go over there later. No. Mm-hmm. So, no, we've been really, really hit by the, uh, the eternal millennial shame. Mm-hmm. So there is that. Yeah, definitely. If we could, if I could just walk outside and shoot, and especially if I could have an out building, we could pick whatever day we want to film. Me, if we basically look, woke up and went, oh, it's oh, yeah. a film day. Oh yeah, just in a heartbeat. Because now we always have to like hope that the weather. We're so far away that the weather is different from where we are when we get up, mm-hmm. and so we can't possibly choose a perfect film day. And we always have to fight the weather, and it makes things really slow and tedious. We could just be like, wow, it's really overcast today. Let's go film. It's mm-hmm. perfect. That would be great. That would be that Lives would change be so much easier. That would be the biggest change for production of the show in terms of headache, and it would also allow us to just dump content because mm-hmm. I can just go outside and shoot something as a preview. I can't do an hour and a half. Well, you're talking about three hours round trip just to do a preview. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work. It, no. it just kills the schedule. Yep. And then you're consuming gasoline and blah blah. blah. Gotta be night and day. Yeah. All right. Um, how is the trap thrower wall progressing? I thought we put a picture up on. We did up on social media That's and, it. and it the was, patrons. That was it. It was done. Yeah, it is. It, it is done. Nice. I mean, to be honest, we we left the edges kind of raw in case we ever wanted to do a little more, but there's nothing really been extra as of late. No, we haven't had a brand new trap brought in. There's It'll take ten, some time. We have like one trap sitting with a friend in France that hasn't been shipped yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's it. And it's really just a metal version of a wooden one. Yeah. And uh, otherwise, they really dried up. It's kind of interesting, too. And I wonder if it was, like, maybe, like, a COVID thing. Because... I don't know. Uh, there are so many available online. It's almost like people were cleaning out their attics while they were stuck at home. And I bought up a bunch all over the world. And now I have There's not like seen... nothing new. Not only have... It's not just that I'm... It's not that I'm just seeing ones... And then we've gotten down the list. And I'm just seeing other rare ones turning up. Mm-hmm. I have seen nothing that I would call a rare one turn up for a year. Yeah, me neither. It's it's really wild. Yeah. I, I don't know if we just bought it the right time or what. No clue. Um, if you could only eat one type of cheese for the rest of your life. Oh wait, did your phone boodle a second ago? I don't think I so. I thought maybe I heard a sound. I think you're hallucinating. Okay. Um, if you could only eat one type of cheese for the rest of your life, what cheese would it be? I have thought long and hard about this before this question has ever been brought up to me. Okay. I have mozzarella. N- in statement. This is just the most universally uh, universally applicable cheese. You could pretty much do a lot with mozzarella. Like in terms of the cuisines that we eat, now I'm thinking about it. And okay. it's a cheese that I could eat on its own and I very rarely have ever tired of it. I'm going to change my answer. Okay. Queso cheese. Which is just redundant. I know everybody's laughing at me. Mm-hmm. But, but liquid form. The terrible liquid Mexican restaurant cheese. Mm-hmm. Because if I don't choose that, then I can't have a dipping cheese ever again. And in a pinch, I could just take a knife and just smear it on a sandwich if I wanted some cheese. I'm really not a cheese snob. That's fair. And it's going to make people mad, but I'm just not a cheese snob. That's okay. I can live without the dippable I, cheese. I could go, I basically could, all for most of the applications in which I would use cheese, I could just not use cheese. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I mean, it's out on some lasagnas and some pizzas, but really Italian sauce messes me up. Anyway, sandwiches don't have to have cheese. But 
being able to do a nice chip is sandwiches don't have to have cheese. Man, uh, I like I like dipped cheese. I remember in one of your videos admonishing Crozier for trying to gnaw a gun. Have your guinea pigs ever damaged one of your firearms? We don't leave them alone with the guns. <laughs> no. They can't handle that. He lives that. in a little cage. Well, not yeah. little, but he lives in a cage. Yeah. And the guns don't go in there. No. He's fine. He comes <laughs> he has, out and he pees on the rug sometimes. He has not damaged a firearm. Yeah. Yeah. He likes coming in this room, though. He does like the smell of the room. He from really what likes we can wandering tell. around in the stocks and smelling them. So, but the problem is we have to watch him like a hawk, so he doesn't chew him. Well, that and poop everywhere. He looks, he'll you poop just pick everywhere. him up. You just pick him up. He poops everywhere. You the gotta watch him because he'll hide the poop. Him. No, mm -mm. no. Um, if you could only use one cooking oil or grease for the rest of your cooking for oh no for all of your cooking needs for the rest of your life, what would it be? I don't it's like easy. I don't. I don't cook. Well, so here's the thing. I guess I would be. Wait, wait, wait. Is it cooking oil or grease? Yeah, cooking oil or Ooh, grease. Ooh, that's a little trickier because now you're going in between what, like olive oil and bacon fat. No, I think you just have to go with straight up butter because it can it can Does butter count as a grease? I think it. I think it's pretty much in between the two in terms of an oil and and bacon fat is what I'm thinking. Okay, butter. But the thing is, I prefer bacon fat for the taste, but the problem is, is that there's not always going to be the times in which bacon's going to really go with what you're making. Butter, it can kind of do everything. It can kind of be used for all of it without being cooking oil. You Dean School of Cooking. Yeah. I can, make, I can make butter for the rest of my life. I can do with that. <laughs> but I wish, it could, I wish it could have bacon grease. I'll miss that. I'll miss that a lot. Okay. That'd make me really sad. Do you not worry about olive oil? No, screw it. It's fine. I I'll use olive oil with avocado infused. That's in, pretty uh, good. In Beaufort, South Carolina, mm -hmm. which my friend Bertrand hates that I say that. Beaufort. It's Beaufort. Uh -huh. uh, no, man, the Huguenots, uh, they died, so it's Beaufort uh -huh. now. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so mad at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in Beaufort, there is a store that just does, like, olive oils. That's amazing. And they have, I think, something about... 60 different olive oil flavor I don't know. compared? I, I don't. Sometimes I, I just never understand what, what makes May happy. Mm -hmm. And we were there and she, she stuck her, she saw, she's like, is that a store with olive oil? And she stuck her head in. She's like, oh my God, it's nothing but olive oil. And uh, I thought that might be no, like. No, 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 no. You're, you're underselling it. It was nothing but olive oil. How, it, well, there was some extra stuff. There's like aiolis and stuff like that too. However, what he's not selling you is that they were set up with inside containers that had little spouts with little sample cups everywhere. So there was something about God, 60 different that. olive oil flavors I really should have recorded everywhere. It. Honey. Because May makes avocado. the worst sampling face yeah. ever. All foods that go into your mouth that you've never eaten well, before. I'm, I'm suspicious They go into her mouth and she makes this face like that puppet from uh, um, the Muppet show. Like the scrunched up guy, the old guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You make this horrible face and then you go that's really good or you go awful mm -hmm. but like it just, never it, really no, certain the, you always make the worst face it doesn't help at all yeah so it's just her just drinking olive oil mm -hmm. and making horrible faces and i had actually the best part about it was i had not eaten anything yet that day oh so God. that was the first meal in my stomach was turns out i guarantee you it ran right through you Two cups of olive oil, probably, in yeah. total. How'd that go on the other end? Fine, actually. Okay. Apparently, yeah. I, I can handle it. Um, to yeah, be so honest, anything it, that doesn't survive my colon doesn't deserve I to. stuck it out for about 20 minutes, and then I just I couldn't take it anymore because I'm just in a little 10 by 10 store full of olive oil. Well, 10 by 20. And he wasn't enjoying the sampling process like I was. No, because it's just drinking various... Anyway. They were so delicious. I... And then I learned you can I had, mix them. I had oh, leftover. God, I had great. leftover gun show money on me, so I took a hundred dollar bill out of my wallet, and I just handed it to her, and I said, "This is yours. Go nuts. I'm gonna go do something else." Because there's a gallery that also Buford has a gallery, an art gallery that also sells firearms, which mm -hmm. is again South Carolina. So I went over there to talk to them. So I just left her alone for it, and she was gone for an hour, mm -hmm. just an hour in this ten by twenty something room. Mm -hmm. We're just, just licking olive oil. Yeah, and I used that ham glaze that I bought there that one time on the last ham, and y'all loved that. <laughs> I mean, it was great, but it's just, I told me you spent an hour in there. I did. Well, I, I had a nice time chatting with the girls, too. Oh, okay, that's good. About oil. <laughs> it was great. Um, 
What is the best meal you've ever had and what made it so special? It's whatever made made last. Not just just what I made last. Yeah. It is. I think probably Christmas is you a good mean, time. Remember when no, I made you guys made... way too much food on Christmas? The last two times? Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah. You get tummy sick afterwards. I don't know, you did you literally just did like a corned beef and cabbage and nailed it. And I'm just oh, going, yeah, that was great. Okay, this is really freaking good. That's and then pretty good. you make it you make a shepherd's pie that's out of this world. It's a bastard's version of a it's shepherd's May's pie. It's May's food is the problem. She's completely ruined me for restaurants. I want to say like Oh, we have this amazing restaurant. I used to. But now, to be honest with you, the restaurants mm. were here. They've, they've slipped down a little bit. They've gotten complacent. It, you know, they're not doing their best game. But in the meantime, May is just, it's unbelievably good. I really like perfecting what I'm making. Or it's, at least making the flavor pattern as, as nice and the texture as good as I can. It may not always look the prettiest, but that's kind of not what I'm going no, for. No, but you're so severe. I mean, yeah. But, it's got to be good. Write, I mean, she writes down every possible variable and then executes it and then will grill you about the results uh, to be fair and takes meticulous notes theorizes what she needs to change in the formula and then ex six months later she'll do the exact same dish with those tiny changes because she wrote them down mm -hmm. and then she'll grill you again and so by the fourth time she's made anything my mouth is watering thinking about it mm -hmm. i'm actually starting to spittle up god it's unbelievable well, I'm but glad it's, it's really good it's by brute force it's like it is, it is. Well, it's a lot of him helping me to, to pinpoint the changes too. It's like AI generation where it's just like, bunk, bunk. And it's just slowly. <laughs> I mean, at first it was kind of a wild ride. But, yeah. Sorry about that. But now, Jesus, everything's on its like fit. Well, I appreciate and, you sticking with me on And you ride. know enough to cross over that you can jump up because not all dishes are starting here now. You know, mm -hmm. some of them you just start up here because you understand stuff. Mm -hmm. But good Lord. Woman. If I, if it's, if I understand the flavor pattern already set essentially but it's it's still difficult in some areas i'm still getting to learn thai i don't really have a lot of experience in indian and japanese is still kind of hit or miss for me but i'm getting there i'll get better <laughs> i don't even want to talk about your japanese you bought that pressure cooker and did all that crazy stuff to get that broth and it was awesome oh yeah that was great i, I love can't, that. I can't wait for gen 2 because it's going to be insane because gen 1 was already good yeah, i love the pork belly that i make now that's really good oh she can do an egg like a what do you even call that what the soft boiled egg yeah, but with the with the soy sauce and stuff. Yeah, I do a mix that I just I just baste it in for about twelve oh, hours. God, so good. She's got time to the minute for how to boil them or whatever. Well, everybody has their soft boil egg time. Mine sorry, is six minutes second. twenty seconds. But you know, I know what's his name, Andrew, our buddy. He's like, he's a six minutes flat. God, the thing has got to be runny as hell. Anyway, um. <laughs> I'm not, you're not. I'm not kidding. People that do their eggs, they have their down to the second. To be they fair, he's not below sea level. No, that's true. Um, let's see. Blah, blah, blah. Where, where where are we at? Oh no. Oh, best meal. Okay. And what made it so special? Well, we sort of answered that. Well, what made it special? May made it, which sounds sweet, but no, it's special because she's autistic and she's going to make it as good as she can. It's well, unbelievable. I'm certainly going to try. I kind of I kind of want steaks now. Um, uh, assuming you guys. Have now the stick is how much you eat too and working out. I'm gonna point out how much do you feed me? Uh, let's, not, let's not talk about that. Uh, assuming you guys have now passed the point of financial necessity, how many packages of top ramen did Othias actually have to consume when all this is said and done? You know what's interesting is that that's that's real. May and I were love pounding top ramen, but you know, well, I mean, it's that and Coke. God, just I was drinking something, I don't even drink sodas anymore, mm -hmm. really, but like I think I have like a small can once every other week. Um, and but you and I were eating terribly, which is what got you to cook. Because yeah, because we were I, eating so terribly. I was sitting at my desk too much, and I was eating ramen, and it late into the night food. just to stay awake. You could see it in the episodes when May came on full time. The just, the disruption just caused her to just bulk up to a thias size, mm -hmm. and then cooking at home and getting some exercise brought you down. Yeah, and then unfortunately, I've just never gotten on a solid exercise regimen. Um, I had some health issues chasing me around that are now well enough that I don't have an excuse, so now it's my fault. Mm -hmm. But at least it wasn't my fault for a little while. That's true. Because <laughs> every time I got near exercise, all hell broke loose until we figured out that I had some vitamin stuff I had to sort out. Mm -hmm. But um, Do you want to take a quick pause for the camera so that oh, we yeah, don't yeah, have yeah, to I'm sweat? Sorry. All right. What <laughs> firearm would you choose to be the basis of a Star Wars blaster? Bergman. Bergman. They already did that. Damn it. Also, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to game this. Okay. Uh, high point. 
Oh, okay, yeah, that actually would be... High point. Yeah. Because then I don't have to cry when they destroy them all, because the number of actual CNN-E6s that have been turned into uh, crazy whatever props... You're not wrong. I think Rock Island sold one recently that wasn't even actually from the movies. Right. It's just somebody made an actual CNN-E6 into a blaster like the movie did, mm -hmm. and they did it well. But that was it, right? Yeah. Like, it's still just a... It's not it's even so from. Well, I, far, I don't remember, but I don't think it's from the movie. Mm -hmm. I don't even think it's like a backup from the movie. It's just not. It, no. I, I, uh, uh, what's his face? Who played Han Solo? Just never even touched it, right? And I still think it's sold for crazy money. God, I don't know actor names. Oh, uh, Harrison have, Ford. Harrison. It took me a minute. Yeah. Um, I know it's too late. Anyway. So, uh, I just nothing valuable because yeah. they all get trashed because everybody's like there's there's so many there are people who are wealthy and completely bought in on the fiction and will just trash a historical artifact in order to get what they want. It's true. So uh, just some cheap piece of crap that I don't care if people cut it up. So high points. Good high call. Points. Good call. Yeah. Um, has anyone sent you the perfect Carolina mustard yet? <laughs> no. I mean, to be fair, we don't have one. I mean, Henry brought me some because he knew to go get it from Henry's in, in That's true. the upstate. But mm -hmm. I tell you, Henry's in the upstate cannot, they've lost the ability to cook pig. They suck at it. God, it's terrible. But their sauce is amazing. I'm kind yeah. of worried about what that means. Um, well, if, at least they haven't, they can't half-ass the sauce, at least, that seems. Yeah. Uh, Swig and Swine here in Charleston has finally gotten on board with a good mustard reliably. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't call it the best by any means, but it's good. And that's your phone in the other room blooping. For okay. Time. Yeah, um, there we go. That was where that sound was earlier, I think. So, wait, is that? No, mine didn't bloop, so it's just you. Okay. Uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> so, no. Um, I'm very picky about them it's because true. they can't be too sweet. Where did we go? We, we went, went over to the Midwest. Is that what you're thinking of? We're in Columbia, South Carolina. Oh. And you weren't there. You weren't there. No Suze was with me. Okay. And the gang, and there's a buffet near the stadium. Mm -hmm. I can't think of the name of it now. They near the Gamecock Stadium? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh towards downtown. It's a it's a barbecue buffet. I can't think of the name of it. You guys can probably Google the barbecue buffet. I should probably look it up because I should probably give them the shout out. So here's the thing: when you have a big group of people, and with this we ran into this um with show shows. True. You're kind of stuck with uh. You're stuck with. Lo buffets areas in which that or, can encompass a, a large amount of people or prepay counters or something like that right right palmetto pig that's what i was thinking especially about. when it's a party that exceeds 12 mm. so we went to the palmetto pig and if anybody googles that uh they have these long family style tables and we managed to take like 12 friends in there it's a buffet barbecue style um everything was good so a couple things were great uh, most notably the banana pudding was off the charts. That's, That's what I heard, the yes. best banana pudding I've ever had in my life. Uh, I don't know what they were doing. It, it was so different and good that it took me a minute to recognize what I was eating. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but their barbecue sauce, they had a, they had a mustard that was too sweet. So it was, it was weird because it had enough mustard to be a mustard sauce, but then they went ahead and added more sugar and I just went, it counts. Mm -hmm. But it's still too sweet. And that's the problem I run into. It's either honey mustard pretending to be mustard and it's not anything right. Mm -hmm. Or it's very mustardy, which is good. Like mustard seed mustard is good. Mm -hmm. But then they add too much sweet. Yeah. Um, this is it, Carolina mustard. The proper Carolina mustard is supposed to be of Germanic slash Jewish origin. Right. Because we have a very early synagogue. We have a German population in the low country. Um, that's where it really came from. It doesn't exist in the upstate as much. North Carolina and upper South Carolina are more of a, a vinegar soft place. True. Um, but it's supposed to be like a deli mustard almost. Mm -hmm. But a sauce, I don't know how to explain it. Um, so if you're picking up, it should, have, it should have some sweetness. It shouldn't be like mustard, mustard where there's no sweetness. But if you're talking mustard taste and sweet taste, the sweet can never exceed the mustard. It can only equal it. If it exceeds it, you've lost the you've lost the patient. You've lost the Othias game. Yeah. And then you die. All right. Uh, we're actually on to the, last, the last question. question. Yes. Okay. Are there any things you don't like about the South? Do you have an answer? Well, you know, uh, it's not necessarily about the South, but Charleston in general, it's a little too humid. It's a little too humid. 
<laughs> what are you talking about? We're only the most humid place in the entire southeast, and everybody it's, keeps arguing with us. It's slightly too humid. No, we're not, but we are. Um, but I guess they mean about the south in general, don't okay, they? Okay, the south? Um, I mean, I can think of one thing that I don't like about it right now, but you're not going to like the answer. I'm going to let you go first, because I know my answer. Well, I guess just that uh, property values tend to be on the lower side here, so... We'll usually get a lot of transplants in all of a sudden. <laughs> That's what my answer is going to be. The thing I like least about the South is all the Yankees that keep showing up. The problem is, is that they're just not really friendly. They don't learn their lesson. They just come in and do the same things they did elsewhere. And some of them are like kind of friends of mine. And I'm not just talking politics. I know everybody thinks that's where I'm going well, with yeah, like no, how not. you vote. And there's already, there's, there's a whole thing with that. Just being a gun channel, the number of people that come in and immediately say, we need to change the way you guys do guns. And I'm going, why? Anyway, no, the, just culturally, just without even the, the, without the politics, they come in and they're just hostile. Like, yeah, it's and, weird. And I was laughing about this, I think in the podcast, cause I was listening to some British people complain about Americans and they're saying that. You know they're an American because they just talk to strangers about anything. They just go up and just go, hey, stranger, I'm your friend now. And, and the British people are going, Americans are weird. Why mm -hmm. would they do that, right? Right. That's how we th – the, the, that British response is how we feel about the, the Yankees in a lot of ways because they come in and they're just – it's not necessarily that they're hostile, but they're competitive. They, they, they'll they talk, but they talk themselves up and there's this very like – ego-driven, dick-measuring weirdness that comes in. Well, there's also... And they, they also brag about ripping people off. God, it's weird. Like, yeah, that, that's weird. That they're like, I man, that. I really F that guy on that price. And I'm like, isn't that like your local guy that you got to go back to like next week? Like, why would you set that up? Because now right. he's going to be cautious with you forever. There are guys that I do business with mm -hmm. that I bought... We were at the gun show. And I, I saw there's an SVT 40 that sold for way too cheap. And it was part of a big package deal. But it was like me and my buddy. I, yeah, don't get into thing. the yeah. specifics. But, but this whole thing. And I didn't need the SVT 40. I, I couldn't really afford it anyway. But I knew literally on the other side of the gun show was my buddy that was stuck at a table who would want it for that price. And so all I did was I like I bought it for X dollars. Mm -hmm. That is probably half of its value. Mm -hmm. And then I just walked over to the other side and I said, Give me 300 extra bucks and this is yours. And he goes, at 300 extra bucks, I have a $1,000 margin. And I went, yes. And he goes, thank you. And he just did it. I made 300 bucks. Now I get it. I lost $1,000. Mm -hmm. My friend trusts me. Mm -hmm. And he will definitely, it will definitely come out in the wash. He has made a mental note of $1,000 worth of whatever. So the next time there's like a pile of, this is the same guy that, I, what do I do? I end up getting a Colt 1878 that I can repair for all of a hundred bucks off of him. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I did him a thousand. And this, it's this thing where we all keep track of it and everybody's very giving, but the numbers are there. Yeah. And these guys come in this environment and they just can't do That's it. That's why you have a hard time with Rob because he's given you so much lately. No, he's playing the game, but he doesn't know that it's perpetuating. Um, he's actually too good at it. But he can do wellness. He's Rob can do well in the South. Rob can do well in the South because he can sit there and you can get into a screaming fit with him and then turn around and get it back under control and then still make the exchange, right? Oh, yeah. Whereas I'm noticing a lot of the Yankees, if you get too blunt with them when it comes time, they just – and they get mad and they're bitter and they keep it. And then also they don't know how to do – the long game, social interaction, constant great. And I get it. If you're from the outside, it's very difficult. It's mm -hmm. it's an extremely narrow cultural experience of this deep exchange of trade and floating dollars. And the more you get into it with somebody, the more these numbers go up. They can be pretty wild. But I'm sorry, it's very hard to pin down and explain. I know, he's got feelings. But you get into these very deep relationships. Right now, I owe as much money to people as people owe to me. And it's not money. I'm, I'm using money as a currency, but there's all sorts of favors and whatever else. And it's all just sort of out there. And it's part of being a community. And I get it that it comes with roots, but these people don't even try to put those roots in. They bottle up in their apartments or condos or whatever else. They only talk to other Yankees. This is a real thing, by the way. Like I talked to, you know, I'll meet somebody that is in a professional setting. And through them, I'll meet friends that came into whatever tech company or whatever chemical company or whatever. And I, I'll talk to people and, and I'll go, Am I the first Southerner that you've talked to? And they'll have been living here for two years. Mm -hmm. And they go, what do you mean? And I'll go, this just seems like you haven't picked up on the vibe. Like, name another person that you know that's Southern. 
other than like this one guy that just introduced us. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And they're just going, no, so and so is from this, and then they'll sit there and they'll go through twenty five people, and they don't, they literally don't know another Southerner because they're in this bob. We have these bubbles of Yankeedom, and every once in a while I have to interact with them, and I just, oh god, it can be a lot. Yeah, there's it's Yankee okay. ghettos. Okay, it'll be all right. They're just so rude. Ah, <sighs> well, that's that's it for the Q and A. We have done it. It is four thirty in the morning. We technically started around. When is Trotter's 9:30, 10? Is Trotter's up? No, we should probably go to bed. It doesn't open until, I think, 6. That's not true. Also, I am not hungry right now. Yeah, but you said you want to go to Trotter's. Yeah, no, I did. I said that if we were going an hour ago. Now I, I want to not exist anymore as a people. Oh, dang, they open at 7.30 now. Ooh, no. They definitely were open earlier before they the They used big to be bug. open earlier. They used to be open at 6 because their, our buddy used to go there yeah, yeah, early oh, yeah. morning. Mm. No, no. Well, um, we did gets it. Worse. We won. The 20, Yankees made them open twenty-two later. takes. We did it, guys. So, thank you. These are again patron submitted questions. We appreciate y'all support, patrons. I hope we did our best to answer them, even though I think at round two I, I got a little sleepy. But I hope I pick back up again. Oh, and they're extremely smug. Would you get off of it and actually thank people? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you all for being very nice to us and not a bunch of smug dick measuring invaders mm-hmm. of my native sure. soil. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, they like it when I wind up. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you all for the support. Uh, if you stayed to the end of this, I'm truly sorry that you stayed to the end of this. But I am ever so proud of you if you did make it to the end. It's okay if you didn't watch it all in one go. The ones that did, I'm super proud of you. Yeah, you got to watch May come apart. Yeah. And then, and then come back together? Again now. No, I came back together. I don't know. We both got to go to bed. Uh, I guess um, we do have to do that. <laughs> I want to eat and sleep at the same time, but I'm not hungry. hungry. I'm not hungry, but no, I want to eat. you thing where you stayed up too late and you want to eat. Yes. Also, we talked about food. There's some cabbage. You could take like three bites of cabbage. No, I'm good. I'm not going to eat. I'm going to go to bed. Okay. <laughs> all right seriously, thank you everybody thank you guys for joining us um really if you're enjoying any of the content consider utreon patreon it's how we get it done uh if you like this insanity that is this conversation for some godforsaken reason you'll probably like the podcast then we have a patron podcast this happens at the dollar level there's no like you're talking 12 dollars a year to just for keep a toe in and a podcast and, every other week. And it's terrible. It's not any better than this. It's just updates on the show and then him, Sally segue over here going on a tangent about yelling something. Yelling about something. And then me there. yelling at him to get on topic and blah, blah, blah. But uh, getting into it, thank you again for the support, guys. Um, we appreciate it. And I hope you guys enjoyed this <laughs> Bye, weird, I love it. weirdness.